We will now move to information and reports. Update on City College of San Francisco. Vice Chancellor uh, Skinner. And these are great. These are from our last meeting. These are great. President Baca, Chancellor Harris, members of the board, uh, good afternoon. This next item is an update on City College of San Francisco. Over the last year and a half, you've received mo um, numerous updates uh, in terms of the efforts to uh, save, save the college and to maintain, help, help it to maintain its accreditation. Um, and uh, we're fortunate to have with us Special Trustee uh, Dr. Bob Agrella and newly hired Permanent Chancellor Art Tyler and they, they will provide the, the bulk of this presentation. But I did want to just begin with a little bit of context setting just to just to frame this and kind of get our minds back on this topic. And, and uh, obviously this, uh, this kind of chapter of, of our history uh, in terms of the board uh, intervening in City College goes back to um, July of, of 2012 when the, when the uh, accrediting commission for community and junior colleges first uh, placed the college on show cause. And uh, at that point, um, uh, it was uh, shortly thereafter, about three months after, uh, based largely off of uh, requests from, from, from the college, from Interim Chancellor Pamela Fisher uh, and, and others, uh, that, that there was a need for intervention that the Board of Governors appointed a special trustee, uh, Dr. Bob Agrella, with uh, stay and rescind power at that point, which was the ability to um, provide advice and counsel to, the, to that local board but also to block actions if, if the, those actions were inconsistent with recovery. Then it was in uh, July of 2013 when the uh, accrediting commission followed up with a finding that the college's accreditation would be revoked effect, effective July 31st, 2014, pending an appeals process. And so that was the next escalation and indi indication that, that the situation was not improving. Um, it was not, not long after that, a few days later, that the Board of Governors elevated Dr. Bob Agrella as special trustee with uh, the, the extraordinary powers, the powers to, uh, to uh, hold the, to assume the, the duties and responsibilities normally vested in a board, and the local board's powers at that point were, were removed. So, you know, th this is just the, the historical time frame, and, and um, uh, clearly, much work has been done, not only by the Chancellor's Office and locally by uh, the leadership at City College, including Dr. Bob Agrella. Uh, but now they've got a new leader in place with uh, Dr. Art Tyler, who was just uh, on October 16th, uh, City College announced the hiring of, of uh, Dr. Tyler uh, with his uh, start date effective no November 1st. So this is, his, I believe, his, his second full week on the job. So clearly, a, a lot has transpired, and uh, you're going to have a chance now to hear uh, many of the operational details and the, the current status of City College from the, 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 the experts themselves. President Baca, members of the board, Chancellor Harris, it's a pleasure to be here to, today and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to address you and give you a status report. Uh, I hope I uh, can take about 15, 20 minutes or so, to, if, I, if, if, if I may, and then certainly I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Tyler. As, as Eric mentioned, it's great to have a permanent uh, chancellor on board uh, at the institution. I think it means a lot to the college as you as you think uh, uh, I think you're aware that uh, Dr. Tyler brings with us with him a tremendous amount of experience in large districts having worked in LA, Los Rios district, most recently in Houston in major leader leadership positions and so we're very very pleased. In addition to that um, Dr. Tyler was the first special trustee I believe appointed in the state of California at uh, Compton College quite some time ago. So he, he brings a wealth of knowledge. He also brings um, the information and knowledge of what it's like to be a special trustee within an institution, and something that I appreciate very, very much. Um, in addition to Dr. Tyler, uh, we are also fortunate that we've been able to hire a new vice chancellor of uh, finance and administration. That's Ron Gerhard, who we lured away from uh, Peralta District. We're very pleased uh, to have Ron on board. We also have a new vice uh, Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Susan Lamb, we got from uh, DVC, 
and uh, of course a new vice chancellor of student services or student uh, development and that's uh, Faye Naples who we received from uh, Golden West College so that along with uh, additional dean level positions that have now been filled uh, across the institution puts together I think a, a really really strong uh, senior leadership administrative team something that the institution has not had in a number of years and something that's extremely important for the stability of the institution so that we have some stable uh, senior executive leadership uh, within the college and so I'm, I'm very very pleased. Uh, we've also been able to fill a number of other positions within the institution primarily in the area of finance, uh, public relations and those, those areas that uh, definitely needed some uh, shoring up. Uh, from the last time that I visited with you when we had many many interim positions uh, within the institution and a number of other vacant positions we're now probably at somewhere you know we, we may have five or six key positions uh, to fill and we're out in advertising for all of those positions at the present time so it will be in a very very short period of time where I think we will really have uh, the entire uh, administration stabilized um, at, a, at a level that has the institution certainly has not seen in uh, many years uh, I would have to say. Talking about while talking about uh, staffing at the institution I do want to again emphasize something I mentioned last time and that is the extreme cooperation that we've received from the mayors of San Francisco's office in helping us staff. Staff not only on a, on a temporary basis where he has lent us members of his staff to fill positions in the institution but also helping us recruit uh, for vacant positions and some of the key positions particularly in the area of finance. Uh, he has been extremely helpful and continues to be extremely supportive of uh, CCSF. Um, Eric mentioned the appeals process. Actually we're not into the appeals process right now. Let me just kind of go through that real quickly. We're, before you can get into the actual formal appeals process through ACCJC you do have to go through the review process. That's the process that we're in at the current time. Um, we have uh, received the names of the three individuals who will review the materials that we sent to them on, uh, on the review itself. They in turn will make a recommendation to the full commission and the commission will act in January to determine whether or not they will sustain uh, their prior finding with respect to the July 31st, 2014 uh, potential loss of accreditation or uh, overturn it. Quite frankly, I don't think they're going to overturn their, uh, their uh, decision. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we, we, while we had made tremendous progress, we probably did not meet the threshold to, to uh, overturn it. It's important, however, to understand that in order to get into the appeals process, the actual appeals process, the step of going through the review process must be taken. You can't get into appeals without going through review. It's also important to recognize that while you're in the review process and then ultimately depending on whether we go into appeals which we would, we would have, we would have 10 days after receiving the official notification of what the decision of the commission is with respect to review, we would have 10 days to ask to move into the appeals which we certainly would do. All the time that you're in the review process and all the time that you're in the appeals process the clock is ticking in the sense that it gives us greater and greater amount of time to meet those standards so that we can continue to work on meeting the standards and um, showing the, the Commission the kinds of progress that we have made. So uh, that's where we are at the, at the present time. Uh, we are working very, very hard with respect to uh, meeting the standards and also addressing the two FICMAT reports and we've made significant progress on uh, meeting the, the uh, findings that we were placed in the uh, FICMAT reports. Um, both Dr. Tyler I know and I are, are very optimistic that we're going to be able to uh, demonstrate to, to the Commission sufficient progress that uh, we do not expect to lose our accreditation. We expect to maintain uh, CCSF's accreditation. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, we have uh, developed our, our prior show cause report which had a significant number of action plans embedded in that show cause report. 
Those action plans are actually the actual steps that must be taken in order for us to meet the standards. Unless you're real familiar with reading show cause reports or evaluation <laughs> reports, and most people are not, it's difficult to actually make a determination of what are the kinds of things that you have to do. You have to find those action plans. You have to then go back and study which standard those action plans are under and so forth. And so it becomes kind of a, of a, a jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together. Those of us who are extremely involved in this uh, don't find it particularly complicated, but many other individuals and, and frankly most people at the institution find it uh, can be very difficult. So with the assistance of Chancellor Harris in particular, and who I really want to thank, we created what is called a Roadmap to Success. And that's using a piece of software that Chancellor Harris made us, uh, made, aware, made us aware of called Smartsheet. And that Smartsheet actually allows us to take each one of those action plans and to place them in a format that it's very easy to see what the standard is. It is very easy to see what the individual action plans, only those are, that's the roadmap to success, the success being obviously maintaining the accreditation of CCSF. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would uh, commend you to take a look at ccsfforward.com. Uh, it'll bring up the roadmap to success, or you can go on the web, uh, the homepage of the college itself, and go to, on the left-hand side, click on accreditation. Under accreditation, you'll see roadmap to success or roadmap. Click on it; it will bring up some 357 items, 357 different items, each of which has been self-identified by the institution to meet the standards, okay? What's really kind of cool about this roadmap to success, if you allow me to use that phrase, is the fact that each of the items is, is specified. The individual who is responsible, responsible, ultimately responsible for the completion of that item is identified, and items that are completed will say 100%. Items that are not uh, completed will show in progress on it, okay? Uh, and so the other thing that's really nice about it is that if you go to any one of those items, you can click on that item and it will bring up a bunch of live links that are the background, the evidence within the accreditation process itself, if you will, that indicate where you are currently in meeting that particular item or in terms of 100% completion, which a number of items are in coming up now is 100% completion, you'll see all of the sequential items that uh, allow us to say that we have completed that. Uh, I'm happy to say that is that particular roadmap to success is being heavily used by um, faculty, staff, students, community members. I'm surprised at the number of people who, who really do uh, look at that. I suspect the commission itself is also using the roadmap to success in looking at the progress of the institution. So the roadmap is, is both the repository of all the information in the, uh, in the process of meeting the standards as well as a way of capturing all of the evidence, which if we have to bundle in a different manner would be very easy to call up and, uh, and put together from that perspective. Um, I, as, a, as a portion, let me, me kind of move over to a, a different topic uh, for just a moment. As a, as a portion of the uh, annual planning cycle for the institution this year and in consultation with uh, uh, staff obviously at the at the college and the interim chancellor uh, Dr. Scott Skillman. Uh, I developed uh, 10 planning priorities for the board and that is 10 planning priorities of the special trustee and I'd like to quickly go through those because I'm going to come back to some of those and tell you a little bit more about where we are on them. Uh, the first planning priority which I'm really pleased to say was was, is completed is to um, hire a new chancellor. Mm -hmm. uh, that has uh, obviously been accomplished with having Art on board now. The second one is obviously uh, to maintain the accreditation. All in one, how, how, how could you create a priority for the institution without one of the planning priorities being maintaining accreditation? Third one is uh, strengthen our ties with the CCSF uh, Foundation. Uh, both uh, Pam Fisher, when she was there as the interim chancellor, Dr. Scott <coughs> Skillman as the interim chancellor, and Art and I all believe that uh, fo our foundation, uh, which pulled away from the institution, it was an auxiliary at one point in time, <coughs> is now a self-standing foundation, uh, became self-standing several years ago, 
after the college got itself into some uh, financial difficulties. We really believe that the future of the City College's uh, foundation and that assistance that the foundation can give to City College and that City College can also assist the foundation, it's important for it to come back as an auxiliary. And so we've all had some uh, conversations with the foundation about that. It's going to take some time. I think we're going to have to prove ourselves again. But it's an important step, I think, for the institution to take. The fourth planning <coughs> priority is clearly to improve outreach, recruitment, retention, and marketing. And I'll talk uh, briefly about that in just a moment. The fifth is to improve accuracy and integrity of their college-wide reports. That specifically goes to uh, the proprietary software we, that we use, uh, the database management across the institution, the banner system it's called. I will be saying more about that. The sixth is to use program review and planning processes in order to create data-driven decisions. So that speaks to actually the prior two, the reports and the integrity of the data that you have at the institution. The seventh is to continue to advance uh, in, with respect to our SLO work. I'm really pleased to tell you that the faculty have really risen to the occasion with respect to student learning outcomes at the college. I would say 18 months ago, well, let me back up for just a moment. Recently, ACCJC did a survey and a study of how community colleges across the state of California are meeting SLOs. And uh, at the end, they, they rate the, the average. What's the average for the California community colleges on a Likert scale of uh, 1 to 5? It came in at 3.44. Uh, CCSF came in at 3.42. Uh, given the fact that probably 18 months ago, and with respect to student learning outcomes, we might have been at a one if we were lucky, shows you the kind of work because we had a number of areas that were identified as being at a full five. So I think we've really made progress and under the leadership of the faculty, particularly two faculty leaders that have risen to the occasion, we're going to continue to make that kind of progress. Um, the, the eighth planning priority was to review and pri uh, reprioritize facilities planning. I'll talk about that again in just a moment. The ninth was examine college operations for improved efficiency and effectiveness. That one was particularly aimed at enrollment management within the institution and the development of sound enrollment management uh, techniques. And then the tenth one was to develop sound and sustainable governance, finance, and staffing levels across the college. And again, I'll talk more about that. The entire concept, of course, of this is to have the, the board create these planning priorities and then those set a general tone and direction for the institution, both in our program review processes at the unit level as well as the institutional level of the college. And I think that seems to be working quite well, and I'm, I'm pleased with that. We've also done a number of other activities, and I'll come back to some of those in just a moment. I mentioned the banner system. Uh, the banner system, which is that proprietary software that the college initially acquired in 1989, I believe. Um, at that time, it was called Banner 1. Banner is into the 8th. There are now institutions that are called Banner 8. Uh, we are probably still at Banner 1.5 or Banner 1 in a number of areas. And what's occurred over the years is rather than purchasing that software and implementing it as a, as a college, as an institution-wide district, what they allowed to have happen is to tailor individual activities at the institution to feed into the banner system. So it became a series of band-aids. Banner became band-aid in many, many cases. And what happens when you do that, of course, is when you tinker with something over here on X, it ripples through banner, but it shows up as Y, Z, M, N, all kinds of other kinds of things. And that's been one of the issues and difficulties with the institution working with Banner throughout the years. A little example of that this summer, uh, changed one little ac activity in the bookstore operations on how students acquired books through the bookstore online, and it affected a registration process and how, stu how that student then would be able to add or delete classes. I was able to meet with, um, the, the parent company is Elusian. I was able to meet with uh, three or four members, staff members of the Aleutian Company about a month and a half ago. We spent several hours talking about it, uh, made the decision that they should bring a team back. They brought back 17 individuals to the college and spent three complete days in seven, meeting with 70 individuals and groups and developed a, about an 85-page report 
uh, that report we're currently looking at. Dr. Tyler, I know, met with the Banner folks uh, this last Friday to review some of those findings that they had. I'm sure that the result will be that we will be bringing some of those uh, Banner folks back into the institution. And of course, what we want to do is bring our, our entire system back up and tear it down, literally, and bring it back up to uh, Banner 8. That's extremely important to us having good data to work with, extremely important, important in meeting on a timely basis the kinds of reporting requirements that are required <coughs> of uh, community colleges within the state of California. Um, we also uh, are coming up and we, our educational master plan is several years old now. Uh, it's time for a new one. We went out with an extensive RFP process. I'm pleased that we have selected a group. It's the Voorhees group. They're actually out of Colorado, but they have done a number of educational master plans here in the state of California. They're very, very experienced, and they will be assisting us on a very forced march uh, to meet and develop the educational master plan, uh, hopefully by the latter part of the spring semester. Very important to the institution and to the planning activities. As mentioned, as I saw in your uh, board report, made a very, very difficult decision with respect to the Performing Arts Center, uh, but there simply wasn't sufficient funding available in the remaining bond funds of the college to build that Performing Arts Center for a number of different reasons. Uh, they also had no plan for the operations of the Performing Arts Center, which we uh, conservatively, conservatively estimated at about $10 million a year. So even if we could build it, which we couldn't because we didn't have the capital funds to do it, we, didn't have the f we don't have the funds to run it and run it properly. And if you've been particularly on the Ocean Campus lately, you'll know that the campus needs a considerable amount of work. Uh, the infrastructure of the institution and it really does need some, some uh, care and feeding. Uh, we did receive a, uh, a recommendation or a, a letter from our uh, bond council with, that I requested that the bond language contain sufficient latitude to allow us to use it, the remaining bond funds for uh, remodeling and maintenance, repair and maintenance uh, for other facilities within the district. And so I fully anticipate that that tied in with our facilities planning that I mentioned with respect to a planning priority will result in a considerable amount of infrastructure uh, and redevelopment, not only on the on, uh, ocean, but probably at a, another center or two as well. Uh, with the assistance of the Chancellor's Office, in particular Paul Feast, with who I really want to uh, commend in helping us, we've been able to develop a marketing communications and retention plan uh, we've had a number of activities that Paul has been heavily involved in and I know Chancellor Harris has been involved in. Uh, one of the fundamental concept, concepts that, that the marketing of the institution failed to, uh, to really address is to do some real good research. What, who, you know, really, who are our students? How do our students receive the information and so forth? And so uh, part of this marketing and communications and retention plan is built on a research base. And so uh, we expect that to abso absolutely uh, pay some dividends to us. And the reason why we want to really take a very, very close look at that is because we are, as you are aware, I believe you're aware, uh, have an enrollment difficulty at the pro pre uh, present time. We're about 10% down in full-time equated students. If that would hold going into next year, it could be as much as $20 million hit on the college's budget, which is a tremendous, would be a tremendous hit on that. We think the reason why our enrollment is down is twofold. One, obviously, the kinds of publicity that the institution has received has not been positive with respect to the show cause report, with respect to the potential for closure. I mean, just the fact that you have to write a closure report once you go on show cause, that's a must. You must do it. But when people hear you writing a closure report, why would you write a closure report unless you're going to close in most people's minds? They don't understand. And that sometimes is placed in very small letters within the body of the story talking about the closure report, unfortunately. Or a byline may have one set of circumstance, and really when you read the story, it, it's the byline and the story may not go together. So we have not received a, a lot of positive publicity. It, certainly a, some of our programs have certainly been highlighted. Just recently, Culinary Arts and a number of others have been highlighted to a very great extent. 
but uh, we think we got hurt by the fact, and, and I think um, other institutions who have received show cause, I think I've also noticed that their enrollments t went down and then over a course of time will come up. So that's one reason. The second reason, which is one that I guess uh, we should be happy about, except it's the wrong timing on this one, and that is that uh, we have a very low unemployment rate in San Francisco. And so uh, students who are able to get jobs, either part-time or two to two part-time jobs, are doing well. <laughs> so that becomes kind of the perfect storm for an institution, a, a low unemployment rate and, and then some bad uh, publicity uh, all lead to what we think are uh, the, our in major enrollment uh, decline. So that importance of the marketing and the communications plan, I, I, want, I can't uh, emphasize too much. On top of doing all of this planning and work on uh, accreditation standards, we uh, were notified on October 28th by the Department of Education of an institutional audit. Uh, we wondered about that. Uh, best information we can get and the institutional audit is across the entire institution. Uh, fortunately, Dr. Tyler has some experience with that. Uh, the information that we've been able to receive now is that the Department of Education has really stepped up its activity with respect to auditing institutions, particularly institutions who are having some accreditation difficulties or something else. Uh, you can't look at the radar screen without CCSF, unfortunately, popping up with respect to having institutional difficulties, and so we think that's what, what popped that in. Um, as, I men <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned, we received that request on October 28th. They gave us until yesterday to assemble a cons considerable amount of materials. Again, because of uh, Dr. Tyler's background and experience in addressing s such audits, uh, I'm really pleased to tell you that last week, on November 7th, all of that information was developed, de uh, delivered to uh, DOE. They will be on campus the week of December 2nd for a three or four day visit. So that's just on, talk about piling on. I mean, that's just another major workload that the institution took on and fortunately was able to complete. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me talk briefly about collective bargaining. The last time I was here, I was not I didn't bring a lot of good news about collective bargaining. Uh, thank you. Um, we have settled with, uh, with a, a number of our units, uh, SEIU 1021, our department chair council we've settled with, crafts, operating engineers, with AFT uh, 2121, we're currently in mediation. As late as yesterday was a full all-day mediation session. I think both sides <coughs> are working very, very hard to try to come to closure. Um, we're the faculty definitely recognize the institution's financial difficulties. We also understand very well the difficulty of the instituting, which we did do, the kind of pay decrease that we, uh, that we leveled on the faculty. And so we're working very, very hard. And hopefully, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to bring you some good news uh, with respect to uh, our collective bargaining there. Also, um, with respect to uh, additional planning the activities that we've done. We created a complete staffing plan using three tiers of staffing within the college, <coughs> something that did not exist uh, prior. Tier one is the critical positions, and so those are the positions that we're really uh, looking at and attacking and filling. Uh, it's one thing to create a staffing plan. It's another thing to, develop, to enforce the staffing plan. So one of the things that we are making sure of is that for all of the tier one staffing, that's primarily in the area of classified staffing, that we have identified a funding source for that as well, so it doesn't just become a paper exercise. Um, I'm really pleased to say that uh, the philanthropic community in San Francisco has also stepped up to the plate. They have contacted us. Uh, I know Dr. Harris and I sat on a forum that they called and made a presentation about CCSF. As a result of that forum, we uh, were recontacted by the philanthropic community. I've been contacted by a number of them. They asked us for a list of activities that they think, that we thought they could help us with. And so we have uh, prepared such a list and uh, given it to several members of the philanthropic community uh, in a prioritized manner. Hopefully something will happen as a result of that. I'm very optimistic with respect to that. 
and uh, another great activity going on at the institution. I can tell you about, you know, obviously the banner system and all of those. And it sounds like a downer, and but I want I want to assure you that there's really some really quality instruction and student services that are occurring throughout CCSF. And there's also uh, a, a really, you know, like morale could be certainly higher. How could you have good morale across an institution that is on show cause? that you've instituted paid uh, reductions on and other kinds of activities like that. But to show you that there is activity and there is really positive morale within the institution under the leadership of the classified um, union, uh, SEIU, they, they created what they call We Are City College. And they've held two days. These are volunteer days, uh, primarily led by our classified staff, but joined by faculty staff, administrators, and members of the community. And uh, the second one was held a week ago uh, Saturday, and Art on his second full day of uh, being at the college was one of the volunteers out there. And what do they do? They go around the campus trying to clean it up, pull weeds, pick up trash, do other kinds of things uh, to reinstill some pride and in, in, uh, ownership of the campus itself. And so it's a great activity. The next one is planned for November 27th, uh, and I was talking with the head of the classified union uh, last week. She expects to have hopefully 200 volunteers uh, there helping clean up the campus and everything. So things are going well with respect to that. Uh, in closing, I, I do want to emphasize uh, how optimistic I am about the status of CCSF. I think we have made tremendous progress. We've stabilized the top senior administrative staff. Uh, policies and procedures have been developed and are continuing to be developed for implementation across the inst institution, particularly in the areas to uh, strengthen uh, the finance side of, of the college. Um, we've made, we have made significant progress and we continue to make significant progress, as I mentioned, uh, through that roadmap to success uh, with, in meeting the accreditation standards themselves. Uh, the mayor continues to be a champion of City College and continues to assist us. And classified staff, students, faculty have all rallied uh, in one way or the other to maintain our accreditation. Um, I have to tell you that uh, it will be, well, I, I initially got involved with City College um, 17 months ago. It will be 17 months that I have been at the college. I have to tell you that I am extremely impressed. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have the, the feeling for the level and depth of the involvement of City College in both the education and the fabric of the city of San Francisco itself. And it truly is a tremendous partner with the city and the residents of the city. And, and I've become a true believer where I can't imagine um, San Francisco being without its own City College. And so I know I am committed to maintaining that accreditation. We will maintain accreditation. I think we are, we've made tremendous progress and we will continue to make tremendous progress under Dr. Art Tyler as its chancellor. And with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Art to say a few words, please. Well, thank you, Dr. Grillo. Chairman Baca, Chancellor Harris, members of the board, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I didn't know that I was going to come back to California, and I didn't know what role uh, I might play in helping another college, but I'm so happy that I've been given this opportunity to come to San Francisco. As Bob just said, the City College of San Francisco is absolutely a part of the fabric of that, in, that wonderful, lovely, and gracious city that has weathered so many horrific challenges in its past history. I know and I believe that I'm building on some really great work of those that have gone before me, like Dr. Scott Skillman. I know that she gave me a wonderful team. Um, I've met with them several times now over the last 10 days or so that I've been there as the chancellor. And I'm very confident, given the roadmap that we've got and the progress that has been made to date, that we will provide the kind of evidence that will be demonstrative in allowing us to keep our accreditation. With that, I want to thank you for allowing me to come before you, and I'll probably have a lot more remarks the next time. 
I see you. I've been sort of, I threw the fire hose away. I've been drinking from the hydrant for the last 10 <laughs> days, so uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Any questions? Any questions? Members? Member Belansky. The uh, report that you had to file with the U.S. Department of Education, is that a public report? As far as I know, it is a public report. And is it on your website It's yet? not on our website yet. We just put it up. We just sent it to them on Friday, but it will be up on our website. Thank you. Vice President Baum. Uh, first off, thank you for the comprehensive report. It, it is good to get an update uh, direct from the source because you hear all kinds of things uh, back and forth. And, and congratulations on the hiring of Dr. Tyler. That uh, is you. very reassuring to those of us. And, and on, on the board and, and we also pledged with you and under the Chancellor's leadership that we will not let San City College of uh, San Francisco fail and go away, that uh, we, we, can, we are committed to preserving the institution for the students. I had a couple of questions though too. There is a closure plan but at the same time are you planning and will be publishing a schedule of classes for fall of 2014? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when will you be promoting that? Uh, well, the schedule of classes for the fall is actually done in the springtime. Um, should be done before April, and that is my plan, mm -hmm. that we will have a schedule of classes for both summer as well as fall of 14. Good. And that's what, how is the, um, how have you been able to take advantage of the additional financial commitment that the, the citizens of San Francisco have made by adopt, uh, enacting a parcel tax and, and other uh, measures? Uh, how has that been able to Help stabilize well, the what we did is we created an eight-year financing plan for the for the institution, and an integral portion of that is the use of that parcel tax money uh, to help us rebuild the reserves at the college, which were woefully low, uh, to help us shore up other areas within maintenance, staffing areas, and so forth. So uh, that's all within our our show cause report that we did submit to ACCJC. Because that's a significant revenue stream that not all districts have access to, in addition to what they, the state has been able to provide through Prop, Prop 30 and others. Yeah, the, the problem with the institution is it got so far behind the curve on everything, from its reserves to its maintenance to uh, uh, staffing levels, very different kinds of staffing levels and so forth. And so it was literally consuming itself in many ways so that it was using um, salary savings by not filling positions to maintain the operations of the institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the institution can't survive it. The, it's very, very fortunate for the college to have passed that parcel tax for the, the members of the community that and passed just that. Just to me too, what was the size of the bond that the, the district passed? And uh, the, the second bond was 200 and some million, as I, I read. And the there, was, there were actually two bond measures totaling a total of <coughs> almost $500 million. But, the, uh, but you made the decision to is, was the arts building under construction? Had the, no, the performing arts, the, what the performing arts center, um, the infrastructure for it. Uh, there were geothermal wells uh, that were built as a portion of another building that they built, the, the so-called MUB, multi-use building, mm -hmm. uh, on Phelan Avenue. The um, the lot next to it, the parcel next to that, which is currently a major uh, parking lot, mm -hmm. underneath that major parking lot are geothermal wells that could, were to serve both the Performing Arts Center and the MUB building. One of the reasons that the college doesn't have the money to build a Performing Arts Center, many reasons, but one, when that building was initially, uh, when the MUB building was initially proposed, it was to be in a joint venture with San Francisco uh, State. Uh, they pulled out of that. They were going to put in $20 million towards that particular construction. When they pulled out, the college said, that's okay, we'll just go ahead and use $20 million and we'll cover it ourselves. But just as important is the college was building a number of other facilities, mainly the Chinatown campus, which went over budget considerably. A number of the projects that the institution um, entered into, the budget that was developed initially vers versus the budget that was eventually spent did not leave sufficient funds for performing arts. And I would have to say also that the Performing Arts Center, which uh, would be a wonderful building, incidentally, uh, I, it's, it's pretty hard to believe that a college in San Francisco would not have a Performing Arts Center. But that, that facility was in both bond issues that 
and never built, never really the first first item to be built. My, the last question is, without an elected board of trustees functioning, how, besides the website, how are, how are you being transparent about the decision-making process and how is the public informed or even invited to participate? In One of the things that I've I've done is um, we're staying on the exact same process and building the board agenda and placing it up on the web and so forth as we did when the when the board was meeting. Uh, that to me was extremely important to do so that the routine and the momentum of building that board agenda stayed in place throughout everything. Uh, it also creates the audit trail because uh, I, when when I approve items, those items then are also go back up onto the website as being approved. Um, I solicit information. People call me. They send me emails. Um, that's that's the manner in which I, at this point in time uh, I, I'm getting input into it. So the actions you're taking as the sole trustee then are published in the way that a an elected board of trustees. That's right. Would, would be inaccessible to the public. And then, you, as you said, how are you soliciting public comment or feedback on? Primarily through either personal in? contact. Uh, people are, uh, have called me and commented or actually a number of emails each month uh, on comments on. And you'll actually publish an agenda of uh, pending decisions and then act Oh, on oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there's, a, there's an actual agenda that goes up onto the board showing uh, action items and then also uh, I've, I've asked for the information items that are normally placed <coughs> in, in board agendas. Those are written up and placed in, in the agenda on the website prior to my action, one week prior to my action taking place. And then, of course, the, the normal uh, internal reports coming from um, the Senates and so forth and the student body. Thank you. That's helpful. Member Sumi, then Member Reed, please. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Agrella for his 17 months of very hard work. It's an incredible time period to have done all of that, and uh, thank you for all, all of your um, you know, service on behalf of uh, the college, the people in that area, and certainly for the system. And then also to uh, thank Dr. Tyler for taking on the awesome responsibility of becoming president at this time period. So um, to the both of you, uh, my, my best wishes. Uh, I just uh, wanted to get back very quickly, one quick question to Dr. Grella. Uh, when uh, you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, despite all the improvements or things that have, you know, uh, come, become better uh, over the last number of months, um, that you didn't expect that uh, the, under the review process that there would be an overturning of the commission's decision mm -hmm. and you would then go on to the um, appeal process. Um, in the review process, um, what what are the you know the most challenging areas in terms of you know why the commission you know would would probably in your opinion not be considering an overturning of their previous decision? A good question. Um, when you file for the review, the materials that the that the commission will look at are only materials that you've completed or you call to their attention really prior to their the actual decision which they made in June. So even though uh, we continue to make progress, considerable progress after June when they acted, they will not take that information into account. Okay? So you actually have to there are, you actually have to show them that they didn't take all the information into account or they were incorrect in the process that they used to to uh, view some of the information that you uh, that you sent to them so it's everything from june forward would then go into uh, our appeals process itself so then all, all those improvements in the appeals uh, that you can show in the appeals process would then make it uh, have give you a greater likelihood that you would prevail that's under correct. appeal as opposed to under review that's correct okay thank you very much for that clarification again my best of luck, and thank you very much for the service for both of you. Thank you. Every um, initially, there was some discussion about a woefully underfunded pension plan for the employees, and you mentioned earlier this eight-year financial recovery issue. Is the pension plan part of that recovery? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, the OPEB requirements uh, are co covered within that eight-year uh, uh, plan itself. 
member Melumen. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Tyler. Uh, a few of us were on this board when you helped us with Compton College, so thank you for <laughs> coming thank back. Um, uh, two questions. One is, uh, how long does an appeal process usually take? So what's an expectation if we do enter that? And could you comment, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal I read today about you. Uh, someone mentioned maybe a new college would open up in its place. I hadn't even thought about that. I. I, I, the latter comment, I don't. Well, the implication was if this college does close, everything's set to do a new one oh, in its place. Yeah. Well, I, this college will not close. Okay. So I think that's just a supposition <laughs> on somebody's part. You know, okay. they're you know, looking at the the good side of a bad situation, perhaps, or maybe the bad side of a good situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and your first question? How long does an appeals process take? You know, what to expect? I don't have a, an actual answer for you on that. Um, it, it, it appears that the, the commission has some latitude with respect to the actual dates on appeals. Um, and so that, that uh, I, I honestly don't have an answer. I think, uh, I, I believe that once we get into that appeals process, we have an opportunity, to, if we can show su sufficient progress to um, to have that that process go on beyond uh, 2014 I'm, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll have that well in hand however so you're still conducting business at the school as that's happening uh, yeah and now at warp speed with dr. Tyler here okay. we we've, we've, if anything I think we've picked up some some real speed and okay. and incidentally I we mentioned November 1 is when uh, art started as the Chancellor but we announced his selection on, on October 16th, and he has been full-time mm -hmm. every workday plus weekends when he was picking up trash mm -hmm. uh, on the campus uh, since October 16th. So he has truly hit the ground running and has done just a really fantastic job in the very, very short time that he's been here. So I, I, I think we're just making great progress. Great. Thank you. Vice President Baum. Uh, again, I, I wanted to peg on that point of clarification and those of my colleagues who have been involved on the commission before does the commission have discretion recognizing some of the steps that have been made to s to actually say we're going to extend the appeal process for another year at least so that they can signal earlier rather than later uh, about the status of that uh, and when does the commission meet next when the commission meets next in January and then it will meet after that in June the commission always meets in January and June uh, of each year uh, to the first part of your question, you know, we'll, how, how they will handle that and everything, I don't have an answer for that because that, that would be uh, commission's discretion, I, I believe. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for you on that one. So my hope it would be that it would be wise for them to at least sooner than later recognize that there is an active appeal going underway and, and perhaps to uh, um, uh, suspend or delay the uh, the decision to for uh, to withdraw accreditation that well, would be the, that would know. be a, a marvelous thing. Uh, what what I'm hoping for is that we can move to a different level. Quite right. frankly, I'm I'm mainly maintaining my optimism right. to to move it uh, off of show cause. But uh, in the January, uh, no, not in January, in June. In June, the, the uh, commission's um, action. Until they take a final action, the college remains accredited. So uh, that could be six months or a year or longer, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's auto they, they will automatically be accredited, remain accredited until the commission takes a final action. Mm -hmm. Any other comment, uh, members? I mean, and just real quickly, I I, I neglected to m mention that uh, in addition to thanking the efforts of Dr. Grill and Dr. Tyler. I, I also would like to thank the uh, members of the Chancellor's staff who I know have put in a lot of hours, you know, in, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, ensuring that uh, this, the state's involvement, you know, has been as effective as possible. And uh, uh, Deputy uh, Chancellor uh, Skinner and I know that uh, uh, Vi Executive Vice Chancellor um, Bruckman and Chancellor Harris and all the rest of the staff on the Chancellor's office have been extremely involved in I know on behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to say thank you. I do have a Any member, other? I have a member of the public. Okay. Uh, I have a member of the public that would like to address the board, and perhaps they could take the uh, microphone on the left. It's uh, Mr. Jaw. 
correctly? Yes, Mr. Jaw, if you, uh, we're taking public comment now. Okay, uh, once again, my name is Al Alvin Jaw, uh, an individual. Uh, just to uh, bolster my credibility a little bit, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, knowing how good the school is and how good the community is, uh, I'm born and raised in San Francisco Chinatown. Uh, I have a lot of friends, relatives, uh, my own kids who went through uh, City College, and every single one will vouch for the fact that it's a damn good school. Okay, so so uh, so in terms of that, hey, I I've, I've known that from the get go. Um, when we first heard about, or you know, when I first heard about the uh, uh, show cause order. Um, uh, set down by ACCJC, I knew right away that, that, that something was very wrong because of uh, all the experience that I've had, you know, um, myself and my friends, that, that it was not a just decision. Uh, when there's a crime committed, the crime has to be, uh, excuse me, the punishment has to fit the crime. Okay, so uh, we're talking about uh, what kinds of crimes did ACCJC uh, excuse me, what kind of crimes did uh, uh, City College commit? Financial problems, governance problems, planning problems, uh, infrastructure problems. Fine and good, okay? Take care of it, okay? Uh, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm in no way objecting to those things being taken care of. However, if you look at the big picture in terms of what the purpose of the school is, you know, very simply, teach the students. If you look at that as the main purpose, how is shutting down the school in any way contributing to the advancement and education of our students and, and the community? You know, uh, City College is such a vital part of, of our community. You know, and everybody knows that. Okay, so um, I would like to riff off a couple of things that uh, Mr. Agrella uh, brought up. Uh, one, uh, you said that uh, there was a problem with stability, um, you know, uh, recently and now. And you have to think, what was the cause of the instability? Okay, sure, City College had all these problems, <coughs> but what's the main cause of the instability? The main cause of the instability was the show cause order, was the termination order. That's the one that threw everything into disarray. You know, all those other problems could be taken care of. Uh, you know, voters. You know, I'm a city resident. I only live a couple of blocks from the, way, from the school. Hey, we hate taxes, right? But when the, the ballot measures came up in terms of uh, supporting City College, they were won overwhelmingly. I mean, 70, over 70% 70 were willing to pay their good money to support City College. You know, so that's an in indication of how important City College is. Okay, so the, the real damage was done by the fact that uh, ACCJC decided to uh, sanction City College. Now, the next part about the sanction is that if you're a serious student, you're gonna be thinking about your future. Here you have a school that has a possibility of getting shut down. And then once it's shut down, you're going to be holding the bag. What's a common sense thing that a student who's serious about his education going to do? Bail. You're going to bail out of there. You're going to get out of there, find some other school to get into. You know, it, that, this is just common sense. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it ain't rocket science. Okay? So, the, once again, what's the cause of the stability, instability? Not City College itself. Okay? Well, like I say, City College got problems, but the real cause of the instability were the sanctions. Thank you, Mr. John. Okay. Uh, the, the secondly, Mr. The John, thing that Mr. I, John, your, your time has uh, elapsed. Thank you. Uh, well, that after. Uh, could I just, you know, like. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we, we, we have got, to. You can make one here. closing statement and we'll uh, okay. uh, have to end there. Okay. Uh, I've written to all of you. Uh, I hope you take what I've written seriously. Uh, the main thing uh, that I like to bring up to you in, in the various 
uh, emails that I've sent you. Compliance, yes, we want compliance to, to regain the accreditation, but it can be a two-track approach. In addition to the compliance, challenge the validity of the ACCJC decisions. All of you are educators. You know when you do a test or give a test, a test has to be so-called valid, right? Uh, for instance, well, let's say I'm taking a civil service test, and I'm testing to be a fireman. Would it be valid if they test you on your, uh, how well you can do Excel or whether, whether or not you do Excel? No. The test or the uh, ACCJ standards have to relate to the purpose and the mission of the school. And what is that? Teaching the kids. Thank you very much. And providing good education. And, and, you know, everybody knows that City College gives good education. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, the board members? Dr. Agrella, I want to thank you for the work that you've done. I mean, it's, it's uh, si very, very significant. And best wishes, to Dr. Tyler, and your efforts uh, to work here. Uh, we recognize that there are multiple aspects to the, to the issues here. Uh, I think it's really important to stay focused on those things that need to be uh, corrected, and we're well well on the way to, to doing that. Uh, I feel a certain great optimism, as the rest of us do here, that uh, with your work, that it'll be achieved, and uh, you know we'll have some favorable reviews next uh, next summer. Very so good. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very appreciate much. That. Take care. <coughs> Okay, uh, we will move on to the next uh, item, item 4.0, update implementation of associate degree for transfer. Seconded by Senator Skinner. Sure. Good afternoon, President Baca, Chancellor Harris, members of the board. This next item is, as you said, an update on the implementation of uh, Senate Bill 1440, associate degrees for transfer, and I'm um, going to be joined here by v Vice Chancellor Ray Russell and by Academic Senate President Beth Smith. And uh, we are going to walk you through uh, an update on wh where the colleges are now in terms of, of, of building out these ADTs. And so we'll step you through this matrix. Uh, we also want to provide you with an update on some legislation that was uh, signed into law um, at the end of this last session uh, that, that, that builds upon SB 1440. And uh, so we'll, we'll bring you up to speed on that. And. Uh, um, Provide an opportunity for, for, for questions, but why don't we start with Vice Chancellor Russell, and he'll step you through this this matrix, the blue and gold. Okay, I, I think you've you've seen this matrix enough to know kind of it's just basically a listing of all the colleges with their goals that have been set um, to be reached by this next summer, and so this gives you the indication that we, uh, as you look at the totals, um, that we are um, currently um, at. 969, um, and we are inching our way towards that thousand uh, number as quickly as we can. Um, and you, you see, I mean, just kind of a quick summary there are uh, a few colleges, quite a few colleges, um, uh, 42 colleges have 10 plus um, degrees. Um, and 88 colleges have five plus, but then we also have some colleges that are at the lower end of that, with only two um, that have been approved at this point. Um, we do have quite a few still in the pipeline, um, and uh, th they're being reviewed and, and coming back and forth uh, as, as they're being corrected. One of the things, one of the things I've been, I did some research just in the last couple of days, was able to get some hot information um, today from the CSU system because what I was interested in more is, uh, I mean, it's important that we have these degrees and that colleges have these degrees to offer their students. That's been my plea to the CIOs, <coughs> excuse me, and to the faculty, is that it's, it's um, uh, these degrees have such power behind them and such a guarantee that it really is unjust if the colleges aren't providing the degrees for the students to be able to move forward. So I, I wanted to know how many of our students are moving forward in the system. Um, and so I, I got some information from CSU. So I wanted to relay that on to, to just give you some indication 
Um, and just the big picture is that last year, about 44,000 students transferred from the community colleges to the CSU system. So that's a, a pretty large number. Um, and of all their transfer students that may come from all different places, uh, over 90% of their transfer students are California community college students, and that, and that would make sense um, because <laughs> of the, the connections that we have. But if you look just at the SB 1440, and, and Garrett, uh, you have to understand, these degrees have only been in place for a little over a year now. Um, and students um, have only been able to really pursue them since they've been in place. Um, that uh, this last year, 402 um, students transferred from the community colleges to the CSU. Now, there's 402 students who have those guarantees in place that we all talked about. They, it has come t to life for them that they transfer, they get a place, they only, they are limited to 60 units to complete their degree. Um, the other um, 43,600 um, don't have those guarantees. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting in, in those numbers as I digged a little deeper um, was uh, the largest by far college was Fullerton College. Um, so I, this morning I picked up the phone and I called the president at Fullerton College, and got him on the phone. Uh, it was a miracle that we both connected up. Um, and I asked him, so what do you attribute the change? Or how did you get 38 students when most of the other campuses were in the ones and twos? There, there are a few with 13 or 14 students, but uh, Fullerton by far was, had 38 students who transferred with these degrees. And he said, it's because we advertise it on campus, we push out the information, he said, in many occasions, every time I get the opportunity in speaking to students, I'm talking about this degree and how important it is. And so we push this information out. And so I think in, in a little bit you'll hear a, a little more about what we're doing system-wide to try to uh, push out that information as well. It's very important to get the information out. Um, and then the other thing, the other piece of data that I think is kind of important because then I looked at um, not only where they went to, but what degrees were they going. And it, it will not surprise you that, as you might remember from previous reports, the three areas that we first started off with were sociology, psychology, and communication studies. And those, those are the three areas where we have stu the most students transferring with these degrees. So it, it kind of, if, if you follow the logic, we had two, th those degrees have been kind of in the system for two years, and we have a huge number of students transferring. Now that we have close to 1,000 degrees in the system, um, I would anticipate in another year, everything's gonna catch up with itself, and you're gonna start seeing a huge number of students um, getting these degrees in the future. So um, uh, that that's, I'll put on my, my uh, hat and my crystal ball and uh, make that prediction for the future. All right, thanks, Barry. So I, I'm going to step through some of the key provisions that were in this uh, legislation uh, carried by Senator Padilla, SB 440, which again, as I mentioned before, is a follow-up uh, bill to his, uh, the initial bill, Senate Bill 1440, which he carried. Um, you know, really, the intention of SB 440, I believe, was to institutionalize um, many features of the of this SB 1440 process that, uh, that we've developed, and, and also to uh, uh, honestly just to, to probably turn up the heat under our, both our systems to make sure that the implementation was was complete and full. Uh, Senator Pedia will be uh, termed out shortly, and I'm sure that on his way out, he wanted to make sure that he uh, did everything he could to, to fortify this uh, historic reform. So um, the. Um, you know, as, as Vice Chancellor Russell was stepping through this this, this matrix, it, it's quite clear that there's a, a a great deal of variation across our colleges. And uh, you know, Barry stepped through the some of the numbers. So I won't belabor it too much, but um, you know, while we do have our, our the positive outliers, of, you know, Moore Park is at 19, Diablo Valley is at 18, Fullerton's at 18, Golden West and Butte are both at 17 eight associate degrees for transfer. You know, those are impressive numbers. That's a, a 
a really a kind of a broad representation of these associate degrees for transfer across the disciplines. Um, and really represents the kind of a, a robust set of offerings for students wanting to transfer. But we do have our colleges at the other end of the spectrum. You know, we've got uh, 10 colleges with only two associate degrees, for, <laughs> associate degrees for transfer in place. We've got 24 colleges with less than five, which is really not, I think, in any um, anybody's estimation, a, a robust offering of, 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 of uh, transfer pathways. So I, I think in, in, in um, if, if, you, if we had to pick, a, pick one reason why Senator Padilla introduced and carried this legislation, I think it has to do with that disparity and the fact that, all, that our colleges, we, we do have colleges that are lagging behind that need to catch up. And, the, and what one of the, I'd say, the key feature of, of Senate Bill 440, and there are a couple that I'll briefly step through, but it, a, a key feature of it is the establishment in education code of some hard requirements uh, in terms of implementing these degrees. For, so uh, what, what Senate Bill 440 in states is that for, is that prior to the beginning of the 2015-16 academic year, every college must have in place associate degrees for transfer in every discipline that they offer an associate's degree in. Uh, for, and for, for which and for which there is a transfer model curriculum, which is is the statewide blueprint that underlies all these associate degrees for transfer. So if, if there's a if there's a, a transfer model curriculum that's been worked out by faculty in the two si systems, and if a college offers that degree, uh, that associate's degree, they must have an associate degree for transfer that complies with these rules by uh, the beginning of the 2015-16 academic year. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that that. Um, in, in many regards, that was that's a similar goal to I think what this board had fleshed out as 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 its goal for implementation of Senate, Senate Bill four, fourteen forty. Um, but I th there's a significant difference though between a, a board's uh, stated goal and and a statutory education code requirement, and I think that's what the senator was looking for, and that's why the governor signed this bill was to, to make sure that, that our college's feet are held to the fire in terms of that full implementation. And uh, honestly, it, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of progress to date. 969 degrees, uh, associate degrees for transfer is I think an impressive number across the system. But there's a lot of work that's left ahead. And I, I think what, what SB 440 really does is it, 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 it's gonna put a, 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 tight, a tighter focus on our implementation, it's going to put a tighter focus not only on our colleges, but honestly, you as a board as well in terms of, of overseeing this implementation to ensure that we meet that goal. And we will, we, th there will be tight legislative oversight on this. I, I, I could take questions along the way or I can keep going. So, uh, Member Reed, I think, and then Member Malia. Well, I don't know if this would be out of order or not, but it just seems to me that we should have a dialogue with some of the college presidents of these colleges and invite them to sit down with us here uh, at one of our future meetings and discuss why they're not bringing their uh, programs up to speed. I mean, that seemed to be just logical to me. I, I would note that, that that approach is similar to uh, the, the approach the board took when we were at the initial phases of implementation in that initial year in which each college was required to have at least two degrees, associate degrees for transfer in place. And when we re when we reached a similar place where there was a, the the kind of the, the lagging t tail, what wasn't complying, yeah. you began issuing invitations for presidents to come up to have that dialogue, and it it provided I think a fairly powerful incentive for forward progress. So, uh, just that that context, but obviously that's up to the board and the chancellor to provide that direction. Member Malgaman, uh, I'm bursting with that same question. So I'm looking at Yuba College, which has 13% of their achieved target. It's not far away from here, and that president's salary is in the news here over the past few years, not the same president. But yeah, I'd like to invite that president to come and talk to us ASAP. Um, Los Angeles colleges are in the 17%, some of them, but I don't think they have a current chancellor, or maybe that's an issue, but I'd certainly think Maybe Yuba needs an invitation, lickety-split. 
because I think two is too little. That's my thought. That's what this matrix is for that for us also, the low liars. Well, I'd like to, uh, if I could shift gears and go through a couple other provisions of the bill, and then um, uh, President Smith would, might want to kind of back clean up and provide some observations, and then uh, we're available for your questions. The, the other key provisions of, of Senate Bill 440 um, include, I, I, I did state before that it institu institutionalized elements of how this, how we, how the two systems, how CSU and the community colleges have implemented th this reform. W one of those features is, and all you, all of you are aware of this from previous updates, but is the uh, the use of what we call the transfer model curriculum, which is it's real, it's the, the was a key contribution of the of the faculty leaders in, in the at the California State University and the California Community Colleges coming together to define these articulated pa transfer pathways, to define what what is that set of lower division coursework and upper division coursework in a specific discipline that really ties together to, to be a, a, a meaningful degree. And, and so that, that transfer model curriculum is actually identified and, and um, defined in the statute uh, in SB 440 as, as the, uh, the, the, the model that, that, uh, that we, we should use to, to build these associate degrees for transfer. So I, I think that's a, a recognition of the fine work that, that our systems have done, and in particular the faculty. Um, uh, another element was um, kind of a building out of a concept that was, it was a, 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 a kernel of a thought in, in SB 1440 uh, that, uh, that deals with de developing degrees in areas of emphasis. And so the, the notion on this, it's a bit of a vague concept depending on who you talk to, but the, 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 basic, the basic notion is that, I, I think that was driving um, the, the senator on this from our conversations with him and his staff, is that there, there should be some broader um, degree preparation pathways that that um, for students who are unclear, unclear of the path they, they want to take or perhaps that they are pursuing a, a, a course of study in a, in a, a kind of a, a, a broader discipline, that there should be pathways that, um, that would allow for that and that, that not every student is equipped to, to select a, the specific discipline in um, you know one of those the 25 TMCs that have been developed so far that that that, that could be a, a limiter in terms of the number of students coming down this pathway um, uh, some of the the areas that have been thrown out there as poten potential degrees would be in uh, liberal studies in, in uh, social studies in uh, perhaps another take on it would be in areas such as uh, health uh, health sciences. Um, so this is a uh, the, the senator uh, essentially kind of re reiterated this point in this bill and said that he um, he, he wanted us to develop some of these these uh, associate degrees for transfer and really begins with a TMC in these area areas of emphasis. And so what, what this is going to force us to do is to go back to the, to, to the planning board with, the, with, uh, our, with our faculty leaders and with other uh, members on the implementation and oversight committee and, and see if we can develop some of these uh, degrees in the areas of, uh, areas of emphasis. And we'll keep you updated on that as we move forward. And we'll, we'll, we're going to provide a good faith effort to, to do that. And, um, but the, the, uh, I, I think that um, uh, one of the challenges that's, that'll, that we're going to be wrestling with as we do that is how do we build TMCs that are rigorous and robust that, um, that, that, that are also broader and arguably more vague. The, you know, the, the, the strength of using a discipline-based approach as we've done so far is that within a specific field, psychology, uh, history, uh, th there's a um, you, you can bring a rigor to that 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 aligned pathway because it's at the core you can you can drill it down to the discipline uh, uh, the key, con key key concepts of, of, of that discipline if, if you try to broaden the definition of that degree it creates a tension that um, because at the end of the day we, we need to make sure that these TMCs are are, are robust and rigorous so 
be prepared to hear more about our, our policy development on that front. We have a, a great team of, of folks who have been working on this with the Implementation and Oversight Committee um, and with uh, administrators from both systems, with faculty from both systems, and we're going we're gonna, to um, see how much progress we can make on that front. And lastly, the uh, SB 440 called on the the, UC, uh, the, um, the CSU and the community colleges to develop a, 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 a communication and marketing strategy to broaden student awareness and public awareness of these associate degrees for transfer. And uh, from previous updates, you know that that's something we've been hard at work at. Um, Vice Chancellor Feast has, has led the way for us. Uh, and uh, clearly, getting out the word to the public particularly to the students and their families, but, but also other stakeholders on our campuses to make sure that they're aware of these degrees and the benefits they afford students um, in terms of the, the uh, guaranteed admission to, to CSU, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, admission priority, um, the fact that students don't have to repeat courses in the upper division. You know, these and other benefits are really significant, and so we're, we're going to do our best to, again, put together that, that marketing and outreach strategy that's required by the bill, um, and it's, it's something that we are, we've, we've been actively uh, pursuing those kind of strategies all the way along. The, the, uh, the you know, one, one of the, the main challenges to us on that front has really been a matter of funding and securing the resources to, to mount a media and outreach campaign. So hopefully now that this is identified as a, as a state level priority in SB 440, it'll provide us with greater footing to uh, seek resources uh, e even, f and f you know, maybe first and foremost from the state in order to back up this, 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 uh, uh, you know, this critical uh, state, state sponsored initiative. So that, those are the key features in SB 440, and uh, again, I don't think it really marks a change in course. It just, if anything, I think it's just going to force us to accelerate and move forward, and, and I think we look forward to that work. So, you know, I, I turn it over to, to Beth Smith if she has any comments, and we can uh, see if there are questions from the board as well. Thank you. I want to definitely thank Barry Russell for his leadership in this area. It's been really great, Barry, working with you on this project. It really takes all of us doing our part. Eric, you've been great too. Barry's <coughs> leading now, so that's why I had to say that about Barry. Um, but uh, it does take our team uh, to make all of this come about for students. And Barry shared with you a little bit of data about how students are faring and the number of degrees that are out there. Uh, when we do the presentation from the Academic Senate tomorrow, so it's a little commercial, uh, we have much more data about the number of degrees that students are in, um, accessing and how they're transferring. So I look forward to sharing that with you tomorrow. Uh, we have a number of policy issues we continue to work on in this area to make sure that the degrees can be put together more easily by the faculty. Uh, we are working on the infrastructure behind the degrees. That's our CID project, and as uh, Eric mentioned, that continues to need uh, resources for sustainability, and, and we're hoping that now with some of this additional funding that's on the table, through some of the grants you uh, approved today, that we might find a better uh, reliable funding source for CID. And we continue to have great partnerships with CSU in trying to figure all of this out. It's uh, a creation of a whole new system uh, for transfer in that one uh, very well-defined pathway. Lots of students still use the, the regular old transfer pathways that are still very accessible to them and available, but I think you're going to, going to see a shift to the 1440 well-defined pathways in the future, and uh, so that requires us to continue to see what uh, bumps in the road are there and how well does it work for students and how do we get the word out so we'll continue to work on all of that on your behalf uh, as we move forward. The areas of emphasis will be sticky for us. Um, we thought we had the light at the end of the tunnel before 440 and now with the addition of these four additional pathways uh, we'll have to really put our heads together and figure out how to make that work without causing confusion for students or duplication of effort and also making sure that CSU can find a way to match. That's one of the biggest concerns for the areas of emphasis is that we could do a lot of work at our end, but we couldn't really put together a 1440 pathway uh, with the CSU's contribution of the 60 units at their site. So more to come, more tomorrow, and then in the future. Thank you.
Is there responding there to the broadening of the AATs? It's the areas of emphasis. Right. Those pathways um, potentially are much more broad and less well-defined, which, as Eric mentioned, could help some students who are not decided at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, for most of our students, the benefit of the 1440 degrees has been a, the fact that it's a very well-defined pathway. The students know exactly what to take and how to count the units, and CSU knows exactly what coursework the student has done. So when you start to make it more broad, there's a potential for uh, us to have less benefit out of the original intention of 1440. Mm -hmm. Member Velasco. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My first question is, is with the provision in the law that says that if you have a local degree in a certain category that there's now an ADT degree that you have to develop the ADT degree. And given the numbers on here, who monitors that? And I'll give an example. What if, and this is a crazy example, but I could see things like this happening. Of college has a degree in applied mathematics, and that ADT degree doesn't say applied mathematics; it just says mathematics. I mean, I, I had. I mean, I know you probably don't have the answer, but. I'm just curious at how that all is going to get monitored. And for the area of emphasis, uh, I'm curious if some discussion will go on in those broader areas where, like you said, a social science degree, where um, there aren't that many lower division requirements, say, in certain social science areas. Most of the requirements tend to be in upper division. It's maybe one or two. Is that kind, I'm wondering if that will become the approach. Has CSU said anything yet about areas of emphasis or? Um, th there were some initial conversations early in the planning process. Uh, I think CSU was concerned about the rigor uh, and, and th they're, because they're on the hook to make sure that with, you know, the student arriving with this degree that they can finish them off in six, 60 right. units um, with a degree that meets all their requirements. So that they were, th that's the sticking point on this. So th what CSU proposed, and, I, and they deserve a lot of credit in this process as well. You know, I heap some praise on the, fa on the faculty from both systems, but you know, there are a great, great amount of creative thinking on the part of the CSU administration as well. Th they came up with an approach which was that, um, to, they call it one to many, which uh, essentially is, is it, say if there was a, a student who did their lower division work in, in um, anthropology, that that pathway could link up with other social st social st um, studies fields. Of, say, for, for instance, you know that might also, you know, a, a preparation in anthropology might also work for. Um, um, I have, I have a little break, brain lock on this one, but but uh, you know other other fields such as uh, um, uh, you know sociology, um, perhaps history, perhaps. Uh, you know, other other um, social studies based disciplines, but but again, the the, the key difference is that it's that they're all, um, you know, it's a discipline based approach, but it's essentially saying that that if you if you get that that associate that ADT in anthropology, it can open up the door for three or four, or even five different uh, disciplines at the at the baccalaureate level. Yeah, if you know, I could I think, add, uh, uh, pardon oh. me, I, I I think we're trying to answer your question would be very premature on our part. There's a lot of faculty to faculty conversations. You will recall that we advised the senator that we were worried about the very question you just asked. Well, the law's passed now. So whether we worried about it or not, now we have to figure it out. So Beth and her colleagues and those at CSU are trying I to answer started. your questions. It's just that we're not there yet. Member Malibet. So... I'm going to ask your advice about this. Um, I think we monitor it, Mr. Belansky, and it is a state level priority. So maybe we could come up with um, the call. I've counted 16 with less than four already done. Uh, is there a way we could, you know, say in four months we'd like to see all the colleges up to the minimum of four? And if they're not up to it, to ask their presidents to come and visit us and talk.
talk about their hurdles, why they're having trouble doing it. Uh, I'm just going to share with you, I'm kind of wondering about something like that, and I'll let you lead us in a way that you think might be responsible, but two just seems kind of low in this well, I, large group certainly here. Certainly, I, I think there's a need for us to do uh, to engage a little more than mm -hmm. we have with regard to this. And, and Chancellor, I'll uh, kind of turn it over to you to, to maybe make some recommendations about that. Well, I think, I think the board's uh, uh, interest is quite evident, and I, and I think there are there ought to be uh, documented progress on the part of all the institution, and for those where their progress is oddly less than what might even be uh, considered below average, mm -hmm. that the board has a legitimate uh, question there. Now, whether that's uh, two or four or six, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, um, we have still agreed that we're going to hit the 100% goal by this time next year, even though the legislation gives us a little more time Barry has told the CIOs that doesn't mean you're giving mm -hmm. them any more time. Mm -hmm. So I do believe, you know, along about uh, your March meeting, that by then we ought to be able to uh, highlight for you if we feel like we have colleges that really are not listening at all. And at that point, I think an invitation from this body to those people makes sense. Now, exactly how to quantify that, mm -hmm. I'm reluctant to do that. Right. No, but I'm but is there any way that we could communicate to the, the field that? This, this will be our interest in the near future so that there's at least a warning that we are moving in that direction mm -hmm. so that it doesn't seem to pop up in mm -hmm. March as something that's mm -hmm. out of the clear blue? Well, just so the board knows, I think the, the, the uh, question would be, is there any way we can continue to let them know that? Because I think well, some yeah. people around this table will document we've been talking to them about it a lot. But So the answer to your question is absolutely. I guess maybe in a more targeted <laughs> way yes. than it isn't just simply for the entire field. I think my memory is that when we <coughs> said two was the minimum and gave them a timeline, nobody showed up because they all did it. So I'm optimistic it will all be done. Sounds like academic standards for bog fee waivers. <laughs> <laughs> so we can look forward to something wow. coming out that would suggest that maybe the board would be considering this in upcoming meetings and mm -hmm. issue invitations. And mm -hmm. I like that. Group Thank you. With or without lunch. <laughs> be, be more than happy okay. to communicate okay. that to my colleagues. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from the board or questions? Thank you very I, much. I just want to thank Beth and her colleagues. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it is, it's a struggle for all of us because, you know, when, when, uh, when the mountain is uh, 10,000 feet high and you, and you do see a lot of colleges that get to 8,000 feet as they're supposed to, mm -hmm. it, it's still, uh, unfortunately, easier for us to, uh, to look at those that are still down at 2,000 feet. So um, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that that, that gr creating a thousand degrees in less than two years mm -hmm. is a Herculean mm -hmm. feat, and and I, I know that we all appreciate mm -hmm. the work that's been done. Considerable work. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to uh, information report uh, item number four point three, state federal legislative update, Vice Chancellor. Well, Vice Stewart. Chancellor Stewart is getting settled, and Jerry Griffin gave me a note to, that says a red cell phone was found in the third floor women's restroom. If this phone belongs to anyone in the room, please let in Jerry know, and she will get it for you. In the old days, we had that. I think that's true. <laughs> Mine is not quite red. Okay. <laughs> Vice Chancellor Stewart. Great, <laughs> thank you. President Baca, Chancellor Harris, members of the board. Um, so I want to present to you a, uh, an informational item today on a state legislative update, uh, which is probably more of a recap given where we are in this uh, end of the first year of a two-year session, and then uh, an update on some federal issues. Um, so in, in terms of uh, the legislative recap at the state level, I think we've had a very busy year. Um, the legislature, as it's prone to do, introduced uh, several bills. In fact, they introduced over 2,500 bills this first year. Uh, and the chancellor's office tracked about 200, a little more than 200, that had a, an impact of one sort or another uh, on the system. And out of that uh, 200, some 50 had a significant impact. So we were, we were quite busy. Um, as I said, uh, you know, we're at the, uh, uh, currently in, in the recess of the first year of the two-year session. The legislature adjourned on September 12th, uh, and the governor had a deadline of October 13th to either sign or veto bills. 
uh, roughly 900 bills actually made it down to his desk. And of those 900, he vetoed about one out of 10. So it was a pretty low rate in terms of, uh, of uh, his administration and prior administrations. It was 10 percent this year, 13 percent last year, uh, and a little bit higher, actually double that in the prior administration. So um, I guess I use that to, to preface uh, when I talk about those bills that we had hoped would be vetoed that were not. That uh, was because the numbers are low, of course. Um, the legislature will, uh, will reconvene in, in January, January 6th to be exact, and that's when we will in earnest uh, proceed with our own legislative agenda for 2014. Um, so that's when those issues that we talked about earlier will begin to move forward uh, quite aggressively. Um, so in terms of the, the bills that we've been tracking, I know that in your packet you have a, a full summary of the Tier 1, 2, and 3 bills. I won't go through those. Uh, I do, however, want to highlight a few that were of, of significant importance in conversation over our past meeting. So out of the, the Tier 1 bills, I'm going to highlight three. Uh, one is SB 576, and this was our sponsored legislation that added a member of the um, community colleges to the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and that bill was signed and goes into effect January 1st, at which time we will need to forward a recommendation for appointing a member of our system to that, uh, to that commission. Um, the other bill I want to mention is AB 955. As you might recall, this was the legislation dealing with summer and winter intercession. Uh, that bill was signed by the governor and goes into effect January 1st. Uh, obviously, that was a bill of considerable debate. I think um, uh, we certainly understand the governor's rationale for wanting to sign the bill, particularly that it is a relatively uh, narrow uh, pilot program and one that I thought, uh, at least in his signing statement, indicated that he thought it was something worth trying. So. At this point, there are six colleges that are named in that bill, and only one so far has expressed interest in operating a pilot, and that's uh, Long Beach City College. So uh, we will see, of course, in January if more uh, colleges express interest. Um, the uh, third bill I wanted to mention is SB 440. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner already went through uh, a great deal of detail in terms of that bill and its provisions. The one thing I would uh, just add is actually the Assembly Higher Education Committee is conducting an informational hearing today at Fullerton College on transfer. So those issues are also being debated in that context as well. Uh, and I think that will be something that they continue to keep an eye on. In terms of bills that were uh, vetoed by the governor, there were three that I wanted to call to your attention and they really deal with financial aid uh, for the most part. Uh, the first bill is SB 1287, and this was one of the bills that we were tracking. It would have uh, changed the eligibility requirements for Cal Grants. Uh, it would have uh, allowed folks to really establish el eligibility one time and then uh, not to have to do that in subsequent years. So that bill, unfortunately, was vetoed. Uh, the other two are linked. One is SB 284 that deals with uh, establishing income tax credits for Cal Grants. Um, that income tax credit would allow would have allowed for an increase in the Cal Grant B uh, award amount up to $5,000. So both of those bills were, uh, were vetoed as well. So I think uh, it, it remains to be seen if, if uh, some of those issues will come back next year, but I think there's certainly a lot of interest uh, in the area of providing additional financial aid for, for students. Um, with respect to the federal update, um, I think obviously there were several things happening with the federal government in the past couple of months. I don't know that there's much more that I can add in terms of speaking to the uh, government uh, shutdown and the subsequent uh, continuing resolution. You know, I will say that uh, for the 16-day shutdown that the government furloughed 90 percent of their uh, employees. I think that uh, tallied about 800,000 federal government employees. Many of those were at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, however, fortunately, that did not impact the awards of financial grant or the administration of uh, student loans, so I think that's uh, certainly a bright spot. Uh, it also did not impact the uh, um, uh, awarding of CTE funding, so I think that, that's again, is, is another bright spot. In terms of the continuing resolution that was signed by the President, I think the indication there is that we will be revisiting these issues as the continuing resolution will fund the government only through January uh, 15th, and then it uh, establishes the debt ceiling only through February 7th. So I think, uh, again, it's, it's so, sort of a temporary reprieve for many of the many of the issues that were brought up during that time. Um, the, the other item that I wanted to call to your attention, I know that this has gotten considerable amount of, uh, of press coverage here recently, and that's the President's College Value and Affordability Proposals. 
Um, I think these are issues that have been on his agenda for uh, a good many years, uh, and, and many of these issues are not necessarily new. I think there's some new and there's some old there. But they are really focused in three major areas. Uh, one is paying for performance. Uh, the other is promoting innovation and competition. Uh, and the third is ensuring uh, student debt remains affordable. You know, I think for the most part these proposals are a reflection of the growing scrutiny of the value of higher education and, and the public's frustration uh, over rising cost of education. Um, I think the reality is, is much of this debate is going to take place in the context of the Higher Education Reauthorization Act, which as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware uh, expires next year. However, that's expected to be a multi-year effort in terms of uh, that reauthorization. Um, the one thing that, that I'll mention in terms of the proposals, the President's proposals, and some of you might have seen this, is that there are a number of hearings that have been announced that are occurring across the nation. Um, the first actually was in California on November 6th at Cal State Dominguez Hills. So I think there certainly was an opportunity for Californians to weigh in on those proposals. Uh, and I think we will be doing likewise in terms of looking specifically at their impact on California and to what extent we want to weigh in with written comments. Um, I will say that I think uh, when you look at the uh, media coverage of the proposals, the, mix, the response has been somewhat mixed. I think there's some concern, certainly on the part of com community colleges, about their ability to be rated, um, the issue of uh, access to data, particularly at the federal level, and then I think tying uh, performance or aid rather to uh, performance is also problematic. So uh, I'm sure that there will be much more to come on, on that particular issue. Um, I mentioned with respect to the Higher Education Reauthorization Act, which will uh, again start in earnest next year. Uh, I think the, the main focus in terms of, of reauthorization is going to be on increasing completion, dealing with college cost, uh, accreditation, dealing with student lo loan terms and conditions, uh, some uh, issues around consumer inf information, and then uh, looking at innovative learning models, I think, are the, the, the primary issues that have been uh, addressed or will likely be addressed. And then both um, the Senate and the House will be holding hearings next year, and we will be certainly monitoring through our participation with um, AACC and ACC, ACCT, uh, as well as through other uh, avenues to ensure that, that we're getting information, sharing that with you, and developing our own uh, uh, positions and comments on those issues. Um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is some of you may have heard that uh, Ted Mitchell has been nominated to replace Martha Cantor as the U.S. Uh, Department of Education Undersecretary of Education. Uh, Ted Mitchell is the current CEO of uh, New Schools Venture and as some of you might recall is also a former uh, board member and president of the State Board of Education. So I think that is definitely someone that we would um, uh, want to make contact when we uh, go back to Washington in February for our annual visit. Uh, but it's certainly, I think, a bright spot in terms of having a Californian yet again in a key position in the Federal Department of Education. So those were really the, the major highlights I wanted to, uh, to stress in terms of, of the federal update. Again, we've got a listing of the bills that we've been tracking at the federal level. Quite honestly, all of those are still in process. Um, so I think you know, we'll, we'll be monitoring those going forward and, and certainly uh, updating you in 2014. Uh, and similarly, on the state side, there are probably about 100 bills that are considered two-year bills uh, in the legislature, and we'll be following those as well. Some of those are, are, I think, ones of importance to this board, particularly around veterans' issues and, uh, and the availability of financial aid. So I think uh, with that, I will pause and see if you have any questions. Yes, Member Belansky. Thank you. I have two questions on bills that he signed. Okay. The one, uh, AB 595, about college priority enrollment, where uh, students with disabilities and students in EOPS now, I guess, are in the first ranking of priority. When does that go into effect? It will go into effect in terms of a statutory requirement January 1st of 2014. Um, and have colleges been notified throughout the state about that? Uh, not yet. So we're going through a process now with all of the divisions of looking at legislation that's been signed and determining which of those bills uh, would warrant some guidance out to the field and then uh, preparing that information and intend to get that out before the first of the year so they have some direction. I think on that bill, though, there will obviously be a regulatory process that we'll need to follow as well. Okay. And one other one, the, the SB... SB 595, the post-secondary education financial aid. 
again, how will that get out to the colleges and districts that, in view of this law, students have options as to how they get their financial aid? And how does that even get out to students? Because I think there are some districts where there aren't options. This is the only way you will get financial aid. Well, again, I think it will have to be part of that guidance process to where we'll take a look um, at the legislation, certainly with the input of legal and laying out what are the various options that, that colleges might have available. And, you know, where there are restrictions, then we'll certainly make that, that information known. And, and, again, we may also find in going through that process that there were some unintended consequences uh, with those bills, and we may need to, to come back next year and look at potential fixes depending on how that all plays out. Member Malumed. Um So I will just share about three and a half years ago, I think it was when I was the board president, uh, we did uh, want to have a joint meeting with the State Board of Education, and Ted Mitchell was the president of their <coughs> board. So we did end up doing a little bit more of a social have dinner together time. We ne I, I don't think we ever met about a subject, as I recall. Um, but he does know us, um, and we did really try to push to work together. It was difficult, um, and I even think of them now. The State Board of Education has a very full agenda, and they're always busy, but mm -hmm. it is nice for us to kind of reach out to them. But he does know us, so that will help, though I don't think he's laser focused on community colleges. I think that's right, and, and <coughs> given that he does know, know us and his past uh, experience, obviously, in California as president of Occidental College and at UCLA, we'll certainly be reaching out to him and wanting to mm -hmm. build that relationship. I will say this, that he's been nominated, so it remains to be seen how that process will, will play out because it's a position does, that does require Senate confirmation. Um, so it, it may take a little bit longer than, than mm -hmm. uh, he may like or the administration may like. Mm -hmm. So the good news is we have Martha Cantor there until he does get the job? Is you know, I'm true? not certain. I think she had announced a firm deadline to depart. I'll have to double check that. I, yeah, yeah. I, I had understood she was going to wait until the appointment. I don't think she plans to wait until confirmation. confirmation. Oh. I don't. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? We have a member of the public that would like to make us. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, we have a member of the public who would like to address the board on this topic, Scott Hamilton. It's up to the public comment. Oh, that's at the end. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, just wondering if maybe you could say a, a, a few more things about AB 13, the, the, um, the non-resident tuition exemption and, and uh, maybe SB 290. Sure. Um, so with respect to, I'll do SB 290 first and then AB 13 second. And then may maybe also comment on any kind of federal legislation that was progressing through if you're. Certainly. You know that one. So with SB 290, um, my understanding and in, 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 in our analysis, I think uh, we should have highlighted this, that, that that didn't place any additional requirements on community colleges, that it really applied to the UC and the CSU in terms of providing that benefit to veterans. Um, so it, it, for us, it was our current practice. With AB 13, I think the issue there was one more of cost and in terms of, of providing the benefit of in-state tuition for veterans um, who may not have California residency, you know, what is the price tag to the state? And I think that's um, an issue that was raised primarily in the Senate Education Committee. I think it's something that the author is well aware of, and every indication that I've gotten from Assemblymember Chavez is that he intends to, to move that bill next year. Um, so I think it's a debate that will continue. Uh, likely on the federal front, I think it's, it's much the same answer. I think um, you know, the bills have been moving through subcommittees in Congress, so I think it's, it's really a matter of having them move through that process. I don't get the impression that there's significant objections at the federal level to provide a benefit of in-state tuition for veterans uh, nationally. I think it's, you know, to what degree are states in a position to, uh, to implement that policy and to have the resources to, to backfill where there is a potential uh, loss of revenue. Do, do you know if the decisions came down because of data that was uh, collected and the, the, the impact and how good is that information? Are you familiar with any of that uh, background? that uh, was given to, to the members uh, of the legislature to reach whatever, you know, the decisions that they received. Right. Reached. So with respect to AB 13, um, we did provide a uh, fiscal analysis and impact. I think mm -hmm. it's 
uh, relatively straightforward in terms of looking at the numbers of veterans who are coming into the state on an annual basis. Uh, I want to say the number is 40,000, but I may be a bit high on that. And then looking at how many of those likely would um, uh, come to the community colleges and then uh, receive the in-state tuition. So I think it was, you know, I think no one can predict with exact pre precision because you don't know what the final numbers are, but I think the estimates were, were pretty reasonable in terms of saying mm -hmm. um, an estimated cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million. I assume that in the end the fear was that they would have people from out of state coming in, veterans coming in, and as soon as they receive their education, go back. Right. So you would have folks who, who uh, did, had not established California residency. They come here. They have the benefit of in-state tuition. They get their education and, and depart. I, I don't know how significant that was because, quite honestly, on the policy mm -hmm. of that bill, I didn't hear a lot of people objecting to it. I think it was more of how do we potentially pay for this and ensure that the system isn't hurt by, by a loss of uh, revenue and funding. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any I'm sorry. I did have one other question. Um, AB 1358, FONG, the Student Body Association Student Representation Fee. So does that mean we don't need to give them funding in our budget because they're going to do it themselves now? That's, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, the way that bill is written is that, that uh, the students would still have to vote on increasing that fee, oh, okay. um, and that would be done locally. So I'm, I'm, oh. you know, I would have to talk through with our folks in student services to see if, if, one, if that's something that is feasible for us to do. You know, I think ultimately we still want to support um, the students, and I think they have a very important voice to, to this body and to the system. Um, and I think, it honestly, it remains to be seen how many colleges will actually um, put, well, I think they'll put that to a vote, but how many of those actually are successful? That will be interesting. Um, because we do support them, um, they don't always like the rules. So that's why one of the things I heard, that they wanted to be a little more independent uh, as their association um, meets and has their uh, weekends and stuff. So. I will be interested to see how that all works out. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think from my perspective, the, one of the most significant issues there is, you know, these are, act, after all, you know, public dollars is ensuring that there are adequate checks and balances so those resources are spent. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, so there's appropriate accountability. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the piece that we're really going to want to hone in on. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Any other uh, comment, questions? Thank Great. you, Vice Chair. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, okay. we will uh, defer uh, information report uh, 4.4 on the Student Success uh, Priorities Project to tomorrow morning and move on to uh, item number 4.5, a model for student success, the Academy for College Excellence. Thank you uh, very much, President Bacher, members of the board. I'm going to ask uh, Dean... Uh, Student Services, Sarah Tyson Joshua, and uh, she will introduce her colleagues. And uh, so, Sarah, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Chancellor Harris, President, and members of the board. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction um, while they just swap <coughs> in here, as long as we don't get any feedback. Um, so, I'm uh, very pleased to have with me today um, Diego Navarro who is the Executive Director of the Academy for College Excellence. Diego began uh, teaching at Cabrillo College when he founded the Academy for College Excellence in, at Cabrillo's Watsonville Center in the fall of 2003, after he did about a year and a half of studying the needs of underprepared students and piloting various curriculum and um, pedagogy. ACE is funded um, by the National Science Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, uh, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and other national level foundations. Um, ACE has uh, received a couple of awards. Um, it was the recipient of the John W. Rice Diversity and Equity Award, sorry about that, um, by the California Community College's Board of Governors in 2007. And ACE was a finalist for the Ele Excellencia um, in Education Award for What Works for Latino Students in Higher Education. The ACE has developed an approach to student success that's 
um, unique, and it incorporates all of the research that Mr. Navarro um, did to, about what supports student success and um, who today's community college students are. And it is um, comprehensive in that the curriculum is intentionally designed to meet students where they are educationally, emotionally, socially, and professionally from the first day they enter college. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and um, let uh, Mr. Navarro talk about um, some of the research that's been done on the program recently. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, thank um, Chancellor Baca and, and the governing board for um, having me come and speak. I'm honored by this um, opportunity. And I also want to thank um, Rachel Spencer, who um, is the president of the Board of Trustees for Cabrillo College. Um, and also to thank all the administrators at Cabrillo College who have helped found this program and the faculty that helped innovate um, and their support in expanding it um, with many fine faculty and administrators. Um, the, the last presentation I gave to the Board of Governors was back in May of 2010. Um, at that point, we had just received um, a, a grant from the William and, and, or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and they were funding us to scale the program. At that point, there was a longitudinal study done by um, the Community College Research Center at Columbia University that showed um, extensive and sig significant outcomes. Um, but it, the end was too small. It was about 66 students, but it showed promise. So then the Gates Foundation funded um, two studies. One study was of our professional development faculty training, which is critical to expanding the program at other colleges and at our college. And it also funded um, a study of the academic outcomes as well as the affective or non-cognitive outcomes that are actually the basis for why we're getting the types of academic performance um, within the students. Um, so I'm going to give you information about uh, our final studies coming out, um, the final report at the end of this year, and I have preliminary data. Um, but I wanted to mention that I have several documents that you have before you. Um, one of them, the RP group just published um, a case study um, of our program based on and looking through the lens of student support redefined um, and how our program actually meets the needs of all the themes and all the success factors comprehensively. Um, the document that you have on top is the um, excerpt document, so it's a summary, but it has a lot of the findings of the preliminary study that I'm going to give you updated information on today. Um, the second one is a document um, from Change Magazine that talks, that really refers to demographic information from the census um, from 2010 and starts to frame the discussion of what we're going to be dealing with in the future in terms of our students. The pressure we have right now is going to increase, not decrease. I'll go into that today. I'll share some of that. I have an evidence document that lays out the Columbia University study as well as last year's NPR study, the interim study. Um, and then the full report, I'm sorry, but it's a copy because we don't have any, this is just a copy of it. Um, the printing's better than what the cover looks like, but it's the full case study um, that was written by Darla Cooper, the director of research of the RP group, and um, Kelly Karajeff. Um, so I hope that this information is useful. Um, let's see, I grew up in Pomona, so I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I went to Pomona High School. Um, not Claremont, because a lot of people think Pomona College. Um, I was on the other side of the tracks. And when I graduated from high school, I couldn't read and write at college level, so I would have been considered a basic skills student. This is back in 1975. Um, and I went on to um, Pasadena City College, where I did um, my academic work to begin my college career. And um, they didn't have basic skills back then, nor assessments. And I just took English 1A and got to be in that class. And so that taught me something about how if I want to push myself, I can actually perform. And um, my parents came to this country as ESL students. They were born here, but they were ESL <coughs> students. My mom never graduated from high school. So I come from a family that's more traditional in terms of the communities that I'm from. Um, it, but what happened to me in high school, in ninth grade, was my mother got bone cancer in 1972. And um, it was very painful. There was no pain control. And I was waking up in the middle of the night with her suffering deeply and feeling despair. And school at that point became irrelevant to me. And what I'm finding with a lot of our basic skills students is that school's irrelevant to them because of their life circumstances and the way that they were treated in their K through 12 experience. It's not about how smart they are. 
It has to do with how they've been acculturated. And that seems to be a big issue that we've been facing from the beginning. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I couldn't read and write at college level. Um, and I just wanted to lay that out because um, I think it's important to understand where I came from. Um, the program, the ACE program, started in 2002 um, at Cabrillo College. It was called the Watsonville Digital Bridge Academy. Um, and we've scaled over 350 students at Cabrillo College um, and 250 students per year at Hartnell College. So it's gone be beyond boutique. We have 10 colleges in four states that have the program, and we've served over 3,700 students so far, of which 3,000, over 3,000 in the last three years. Um, and so, um, and we've also trained over 900 faculty from 55 community colleges. So we have a pretty in-depth understanding of professional development, and we've had the University of California Center for Justice, Tolerance, and Community study our program, thanks to James Irvine Foundation funding. Um, they did a two-year study of our faculty training. Um, so if, what I'd like you to walk away with, if you remember anything, from this presentation are two things. One is, is that to improve outcomes for students, we need to fund successful completion. It's, and that includes basic skill sequence, that the completion becomes a very important agenda item in terms of our ability to bring in different types of pedagogy that aren't necessarily indicative of what we're doing today. Um, and we need to look at um, the issue of lowering quality standards versus bringing in different types of pedagogy to de deal with basic skills. Community colleges are great institutions. My wife went to community college. My two kids graduated from high school early, went to community college. My daughter transferred to Swarthmore College. And she found that she was totally prepared to go to that school. And so community colleges are a great resource. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some students. One student is a woman named Charlotte. And Charlotte um, was a DNF student in high school. And she attended Cabrillo College but dropped out twice. Um, and then finally she came into our program. She, she um, assessed into um, basic skills, um, English, and math. And she attended our program in fall of 2010. Following being in our program, our program's a one semester intervention. And then after that semester, we do nothing to follow with the students except for to track their performance through transcripts but we don't provide any ongoing support to students except for what they, any student in the college could get. We, in order to make it sustainable, we had to design it that way. And Rock Fotenhauer, the Dean of um, Workforce Development at our college, was the one that helped me think through the design of this back in 2002, because we wanted to make it sustainable and scalable <coughs> in the community college system. So, um, so, so, the, the, so um, Charlotte um, attended our program in fall of 2010. She became the president of the Honor Society two semesters later, then became the president of our student body for two years in a row, which was the only person that's ever done that in our school's history. And she's now transferred to UC Santa Cruz as a sociology major. She was a DNF student in high school. Okay, two of our trustees, we have a student trustee named Steve this year. He was a student that um, came out of prison but was exonerated for his role that led him to that. It wasn't, he was being accused of something that he didn't actually do. Um, he, is a, he has a 3.9 GPA coming out of our program. He was also dropped out of high school when he was in 10th grade. Um, I have another student named Jerry, who's also um, uh, on our student senate. And Jerry um, pushed a cart um, 10 years ago. He was a street person. And he found something about college that was important to him. So students can transform if they have the right kind of environment. And so the second thing I want you to walk away with is not only about um, successful completion, but the second one is that we have to rethink entry to college. It, the first two to three weeks of college are the most important time that a student has in making a decision whether they are a college student. I was talking to Byron McClenney. I don't know if you know Kay McClenney and Byron McClenney. Last week, um, they held an institute called the Men of Color Institute that was um, funded by Kresge Foundation, and I was asked to be there as a resource person to talk about men of color and how we're able to um, support them. And Byron was telling me a story about his granddaughter who just started at Dartmouth. And he said, Diego, you know, you know um, what their orientation's like? And I said, yeah, my daughter went to Swarthmore. You know, it's at least one week, if not two week orientation because they value their students. 
They know that identity development is absolutely critical to performance in high-pressured situations. And our students going through basic skills are going through a high-pressured situation because they have not been successful before. And so they have all those things they're carrying on their backs. And so we need to rethink orientation. So the second thing I'd like you to think about is that when I go around and talk to colleges about orientation, which our, you know, our Student Success Act of 2012 is focusing on, they're thinking of orientation as two to four hour courses. It's very different than if you go to schools that are four year colleges and some of which are elite in some way. They think about orientation differently and I think that's an important thing for us to consider. So that's the second thing I'd like us to think about. Um, so what I'd like to talk about now is evidence about the program. Just to give you an idea about the ACE model. Um, there are four qualities about our program. One is that we have evidence that it works. Um, it has high achievement rates, um, and those documents that I handed out will give it to you. The second is that it's sustainable. It costs about $8 per student per semester over and above the courses that they're taking. And the reason we do that is because we create a peer network through curriculum that helps the students support each other, providing a 24 by 7 student support environment for the students. And the document on redefining student, um, or student support redefined starts to articulate that so you can understand it's a different kind of a model. It's a peer network model done through curriculum in the classroom. The third thing that makes it different is that it's scalable and adaptable to different college environments. And we replicate the outcomes at the different colleges, the same academic outcomes. So let's look at some of the evidence. Um, the demographics that I'll, or the agenda I'm going to go over is academic evidence of the program, what is ACE, why it's effective um, in terms of pedagogy, and question and answers. In terms of academic performance, before I get to that, I wanted to at least put this in the context of what you're working with, which is the Student Success Task Force. I was looking at the recommendations. And if we look at point 3.3, .3, promote benefits of full-time attendance, our program is full-time. It's about 16 and a half units the first semester because we find that intensity is actually the critical nature of having students shift their identity <coughs> has to do with intensity. Full-time is really critical. The second is begin addressing basic skills deficiencies in the first year. We focus on the first semester and we focus on the first two weeks because that's really critical for students. The other area that you have is 5.1, alternative basic skills curriculum. And the ACE program is, um, is talked about or mentioned um, or listed in the document that um, has come out, basic skills completion. Um, so we're involved in that. And then 6.1, enhanced professional development opportunities, improved use of professional development resources. So as you listen to my presentation, it, you could look, through, look at it through the lens of the success task force. And finally, aligning <coughs> resources to invest in orientation um, was one of the things. So academic evidence. This study that's coming out in December it has an N of about 1,088. The one that's referred to in these documents that I handed out is 658, which was the inter interim. Um, if you look at these, this data, the demographics, is that 70% of the students are either Latino or African American. So it's a high group of marginalized students. 90% of them have basic skills level in English, of which 48% are two levels or more below. 89% are two, more, two levels or more below in math. 26% of these students have no high school diploma when they came in or had a GED. Um, and 77% of them identified themselves as high risk, meaning they had unstable homes, or they were homeless at some point in their life, or that they had been on probation. So there's a um, very high risk group here. Actually, the one on probation was 29%, so a little bit less than a third. So that's the kind of group that we're looking at in terms of the ACE program that was studied. Um, and the outcomes that, um, that came about in terms of transfer level English, it, one semester after attending, these are longitudinal data points where we're looking at the students passing of transfer level English, which is not the course that we teach. We teach one level below transfer because the students are coming in not prepared for transfer level education. So after they leave our program, how well do they do one semester after and how well do they do two semesters after with a comparison group based on propensity score matching, which is a very um, a good, very um, high integrity model of evaluation. The, the, um, the non-participant comparison group was 199,000 students. If you look at it, it was two times more likely to pass transfer level English one semester after our program 
and 1.5 times more likely to pass transfer level English two semesters afterwards. If we look at math, we had a smaller N in this group. Um, primarily, it was done at Los Madonas College, um, and there was an ACE cohort there of 113 students, of which one semester after attending our program, they had a 4.3 times more likely to pass transfer level math, and a 3.3 times more likely to pass transfer level math um, two semesters after. Um, so what does this mean financially? So if you have a difference in completion with the way that we're currently doing developmental ed, and you have a different methodology that actually improves the likelihood of passing, what kind of financial impact does that have? Well, fortunately, the results of this study um, shows that our students have a 28-point gain in math. And I found um, a presentation that Rob Johnstone recently gave um, where he looked at a 28% change in, um, in the students' passing of math, transfer level maths, um, at Cuyamaca College. And what he found was that there was a $1,000 difference between the cost for students that um, were in developmental ed and those that were in CAP happens to be the California Acceleration Project, um, which is the methodology that we use in our, our math approach. So it's a $1,000 difference which if you multiply that by the number of basic skill students that need to take math, it turns out to be a pretty big number. Um, so that, that there's a financial impact around um, these kinds of outcomes. Finally, the study looked at students that took both transfer level, took both math acceleration and English acceleration in the same semester. What I'm finding nationally is that there's a belief that you have to separate math acceleration and English acceleration because it's too much for the student. We're finding that that's not the case when you provide them with a 24 by 7 student support environment of peers supporting each other. And these results actually show you a difference. These are students that take both math and English acceleration in one semester and this is do they pass both transfer level math and transfer level English following that semester. They're 7.8 times more likely to pass transfer level in math and English one semester later and they're four times more likely to pass transfer level math and English two semester later. So these are pretty significant changes. It's actually a different way of looking at how do we do acceleration of basic skill students in both math and English at the same time. So that's the evidence that we have that I, that I wanted to share with you. Um, so what is the ACE? Oh, so the findings are the ACE reduces cost of remediation allowing reallocation of resources to transfer level courses. And that's one area that we want to be putting more resources into, but we have to make more efficient our basic skills programs in order to release those resources. We also help students complete transfer level English and math sooner, which results in a significant decrease in student tuition and book costs and wage gains. In addition, academic outcomes are replicable at multiple colleges, some serving hundreds of students. So the data I showed you was four colleges of over 1,000 students. So what we're able to do is we're able to replicate the outcomes at multiple colleges because we have a model that has integrity. It has professional development. It has detailed curriculum that the faculty learn to use in terms of affective and experiential curriculum. And it has mentoring through that first semester of faculty teaching this new type of model. Um, in addition, A students experience a high velocity of advancement through transfer level English and transfer level math. So what is the ACE model? The ACE model um, is designed for low-income, first-generation, and tentatively committed community college students. It holistically addresses student needs rather than discrete set of services that we give to students. It's sustainable through delivery of support through curriculum in the classroom. Okay, so it's done through the classroom environment, which means apportionment and tuition covers the cost of the intervention. Um, it, it's ac academic outcomes can be replicated across different institutions, it's a scalable approach because it's based on a train-the-trainer model. We have four colleges now that are doing their own in-house training of their faculty because we train faculty to train faculty so that they can perpetuate the model and not have to pay for professional development expenses outside their college. The ACE model can be adapted in a variety of ways to serve different types of learners. We started out with basic skills. It's now being used for career technical education. It's used for college-ready students, which I'll show you some examples of that. Um, but first, the model. In order to understand how the model is used, let me give you an idea of what it is. So a student engagement model, most models follow this. You want to get the students to believe they can do what they're 
about to do, which is to become successful college students when they weren't before. So you have to light the fire inside of students, and there's many different ways that programs do that. Okay? From there, you have to, on a regular basis, monitor student progress and motivate students and deal with behaviors and help students solve life problems. Those are just things that especially first-generation students need support with. And you tie that to an academic program because academics is what we're trying to do in the college environment. So that's pretty much a basic model. What's different about the ACE approach is that we do the first one in a three-credit course. It's a course. It's replicable. It has replicable outcomes. We have non-cognitive measures of student <laughs> self-efficacy. We have measures of hope, college identity, mindfulness, and we show in two weeks we shift seven of the eight mediating factors by a .001 level of significance, which is pretty significant. And this is an N of a 735 students at seven colleges. So this foundation course is really critical in making that shift for the students, which colleges like Dartmouth and Swarthmore do with their students, even though they're ready for school. Okay, the second thing we do is we have a second class called the ACE Team Self-Management course, and that's the course that has curriculum that builds the peer cohort and allows the peer cohort to support each other 24 by 7 to monitor their progress, to motivate themselves, to deal with behaviors, and to help them solve life problems. They do it together. And so we have curriculum that allows that, and we tie that to academic program variations. So what's happened now, as we've looked at a number of colleges that have adopted the program, is that the one way that the program's being adapted is through just taking the foundation course and putting it in front of a program like a nursing program. We have it at our nursing program at Cabrillo, nursing program at Hartnell. It's also being used in general ed requirements for several colleges for radiological technology. So you just use that to, to create the peer cohort because these students are already pre prepared for college. They just need that initial um, connection. The second way is a summer bridge. And this is a summer bridge that's been piloted in Florida, started with 200 students the very first time implemented. The third is CTE. We have it in medical assisting, green jobs, sustainable construction, agricultural machinery. What they're doing is they're taking the foundation course and the team self-management course and tie it to their career technical education program. It's sustainable because it provides the students with support that they don't need to get outside support services to help with. Affective booster to learning communities, and finally an accelerated academic learning model, which is the model that we, I've been showing you the results from. That model comes in two forms. One is accelerated English and math, and the other is STEM. That the National Science Foundation has been funding us since 2003, and the latest grant is to look at doing science remediation in one semester. So we get students to college level performance in physics, chemistry, and biology in one semester, and we've run that three times now, three pilots for three semesters of that program. So that's what the ACE program is, and why is affective pedagogy important? So what we do in those first two weeks and what we build in the team self-management course is the student's ability to struggle, the student's ability to face the challenges that they gave up on before, usually because they're basic skill students. So what, what's different about it? Well, affective pedagogy is important. So um, this chart is in that article on Change Magazine. This is by Tom Mortensen. It's based on 2010 Census Bureau statistics. Um, if you look at bachelor's degree attainment by age 24, we're doing well with top income quartile students. They more than doubled since 1970. But if you look at the bottom income quartile, it stayed flat. And this is a social justice issue. This is a social, are these students not smart? It has nothing to do with the students. It has to do with what we're doing with them in the classroom. Okay. Completion of degrees is a social justice issue. Now, is this going to change much? Well, if you look at the data that came out in the Pew Charitable Trust, Hispanic Center in September of 2011, we have 15 million students in the K through 12 system that are going to be impacting the community college system. And we have 2 million colleges and 2 million students in California. We have 10 million to 12 million students nationwide, depending on whose data you look at. And this is 15 million students coming through the system. This problem isn't going to stop. It's going to increase because of the divide that we have right now in terms of income disparity. And one of the important things is that poverty is increasing, yet most community colleges were created for a different student population. Let me repeat that again. Poverty is increasing, but community colleges were designed for a different student population. 
know, we're really good with transfer level students. We're really good with, with CTE type programs. But our students have changed because of the communities around us have changed. And what do we do to deal with that? And what we're finding is that when students are dealing with vestiges of vigilance and survival in tough situations, and students coming from poverty, I grew up in Pomona, and we had the Crips and the Bloods, we had students getting shot after school, it was a pretty tough place, and I was out on the streets. You have vis vestiges of violence you know, that are, are creeping into your, your consciousness. They have poor educational experiences. And you can look at a number of schools that are in these communities, they're not very well performing schools. Okay? A large portion of them leave college early. They don't agree, they don't complete. So what, but you know what the real irony is? Is that these students have persist, they have a strength in persistence and survival. These students have a strength and persistence and survival. They actually survive in situations that I think would be very difficult for my children to survive in because they haven't had to live that kind of a life. But why don't they succeed at the community college and in higher education in general? Well, the reason is that we haven't figured out how to translate that strength into the academic environment as a system. And that's one thing that our model does. It helps the students culturally, personally, and emotionally make that transition to a college environment. So um, the other thing, reason why affective non-cognitive pedagogy is important, and this is spelled out in the RP Group's case study, is that students are more likely to succeed if they have certain affective behaviors um, when they start their educational um, journey. And this data comes out of University of Chicago. Recently, a year ago, had a report on affective, um, um, affective impact um, or impact of affective pedagogy and um, approaches. Very effective. If you look at Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Te Teaching, their productive persistence work is tied directly to that. If you look at Carol Dweck's work on mindsets at Stanford and Angela Duckworth's work on grit at the University of Pennsylvania, it's all focused on affective. Students from poverty need this kind of programming to help them out. The second area, which I mentioned earlier, is that how students experience the first three weeks of college enrollment can significantly impact their achievement. And this is the work that comes out of the SENSE work in the, in the, um, community, the Center for Community College Student Engagement. Um, also, accomplishing 20 units in a student's initial year at college can advance their likelihood of succeeding in transfer level courses. Well, that data is very clear. It's Shulock showed that, Horn and Luz showed that information. Well, you have to have intensity, um, full-time environment. Um, effectiveness of accelerating the movement of students through basic skills into transfer level. I mean, if you look at Edgecombe's work at CCRC or Tom Bailey's work or Katie Hearn's work here locally in the California Acceleration Project, there's a lot of data that shows that these things work. And so what I'd like to just say at the very end as a conclusion um, is that I'm bringing good news. Okay, we have figured out how to do this. And it's not we meaning me and ACE. It's a number of programs that are out there that are starting to develop the evidence with large ends that we can actually do this. Okay? And so what we need to do is we need to fund successful completion of gatekeeper English and math courses so that these types of approaches can get some traction. The second is that we have to rethink entry to community college. The first two or three weeks are actually crucial. And we need to rethink orientation beyond two to four hours. And I don't know how we do this, because within the community college system, that's the mindset right now. We cannot afford to use our resources on orientation. And that's actually the opposite of what the best schools in the country do. Um, so we need to support intensive, affective, non-cognitive instruction um, in longer orientations and deliver support through the classroom to our students so that it's sustainable and scalable. So our students deserve it as much as the students that go to elite colleges. And I, that's pretty much um, my presentation. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions? Amber Ramos? Hey, Diego. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Thank you. I've been thinking about you since you were here. It's been a while, but um, I thought about you a lot. And the reason is because at the time I was so impressed by your presentation and early findings that I was convinced that this is something that we need to do system-wide. And one of the things that was most compelling about your presentation that I didn't hear a lot of in this presentation, maybe for reasons of time, was the high import 
of cultural relevance, history, a sense of self and identity that was built into your orientation that particularly for some of the Latino students that you focused on the first time were really strong elements of their success going forward and their ability to break through some of these barriers that you uh, talked about. Um, I know that some of the more mechanical and procedural aspects of what you talked about are essential. That's mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. But is there anything else you want to say about um, this question of cultural content, of historical um, identity, of a sense of place and purpose that comes in a more relieved way, relieved way when you get these uh, students together in a cohort? And also, the, can you talk about the import of them having a mutual support network that they're built into from the start of their studies as opposed to sort of just integrating into the school or the district uh, as a matter of luck or good fortune? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the question. Um, there's two parts to that question. One is students, and the other one is faculty. Because cultural relevance actually goes in both areas, and we have a lot of experience now in both. Um, in terms of students, the way that we build it in is in the team self-management course primarily because our goal is to help students learn to code switch. And we're not interested in our students coming up with a new identity. What we want them to be able to do is to identify as a college student, that that's the right place for me to be, even though my family never went to college. You know, this is the right place for me to be. This is my place. I own this place because I deserve to be here even though I didn't do well in high school. That's the switch we want. But we don't want them to lose the strengths of what their family culture brings them and their ethnic culture. And so what we do is we embed in the curriculum and the pedagogy, um, we first develop a lifeline that they have to lay out what their life was, what was significant in their lives, what were the hard parts of their life. They have to think through those things that become the skeletons in the closet as you accelerate students. When you put students under pressure, things start to come back to them. Okay? And what you want to do is you want to seed that up front. What I'm talking about is changing education so that it's actually relevant for today for today's students. And what we're finding is that you need to seed those things. So one way we do it is through a life map. And we take a couple classes to help them lay that out and they have a lot of homework to, to lay it out. The second is we have them write a family history paper. And the family history paper is about the strengths of your family. And what is it that your family has had to do in order to support you to be successful in your life? And this is where students that were colorful in their background really start to come to come home about my parents really suffered to make me help me do well and look at what I've done with my life. Okay? It just helps them rethink who they are and embed it in the strengths of their family and the culture which they come from. And I think that's an extremely important thing that one must do. We also want students to take multicultural courses, which they do after they leave our program. So we talk about the other resources that are at the college that provide those, and especially courses in history, courses in different study areas. Um, and that's very important. The third thing that we do is that we have a social justice primary research course. One of the reasons why acceleration is occurring in our program is that students have a deep strength. I, I say that they have a PhD in social injustice. They understand it inside and out. So what we do is we use a graduate school pedagogy with them called primary research. So the students develop research questions. They know the topic. They develop research questions, teach them how to do that. Take those research questions, develop survey questions, quantitative and qualitative questioning. Have them correlate their, research, their survey questions with their research questions. Are they going to actually answer their research questions with their surveys? Okay, now they have a survey. They go out and interview 150 people. Now they've got this data set, 45 questions by 150 on a topic they really care about. You think they're going to learn math? Yeah. They learn statistics. That way we do pre-statistics in you know, the stat way approach because it's relevant to what they're learning. Okay, that's why we get the acceleration in the math that we're getting. It's a contextualized math in a strength area of the students. So by doing these social justice projects, they're looking at topics that they've been suffering through, their family's been suffering through, their neighborhoods have been suffering through, like privatization of prisons, why youth join gangs. I mean, they pick the topics. We, we, have, we go around, we prioritize. This semester, my students are studying um, disadvantaged families. What effect does that have on education attainment and job attainment? The other one's looking at poverty, and the third one's looking at homelessness. So they bring the topics into the classroom that they're interested in. You use that kind of pedagogy to transform the student to become community college students. They now have the data, what's the findings? They come up with the needs, 
come up with an action plan because you want students to act. You want them to think through how are they going to make this change because when they go get a job, the people that get promoted are the ones that want to make change happen. So get them in that orientation towards change. And social change is good too. I mean, that's a good thing to be teaching them. They learn those skills of project management. They learn the skills of how to organize. They have teammates that are relying on them. So if they slough off, they can't. And they've got to deal with it because their teammates are going to put a lot of pressure on them. And then they finally do a rites of passage. They give a presentation to the public, usually the mayor's there, the president of the college. This data our communities need because UC can't get into the parties that my students get into to collect data. Okay, so this is very important information. They see themselves as a scholar when they come out of that first semester. That's the kind of rites of passage we need, more than driver's license, more than GEDs and high school diplomas. Okay, we need rites of passage for students, and that's what we do. So the one area is students, and that's how it's through social justice that they keep their identity as well, because it's ingrained in their community. In terms of faculty, it's a big issue. I mean, what I've found is that in urban environments, when you have power situations, those usually show up in professional development environments. And so making faculty aware of cultural competency is really a big issue. And it's something we've been spending a lot of time on, developing exercises and methodologies to help wake up and help them become aware as well as administrators and staff. It's important. What we're finding in terms of staff, there's a study that Broward College did, which is out of Florida. They found that 25% of their students never make it to the classroom. That they go into admissions and records and they leave, or financial aid, and they leave. So we're, you know, when we see our outcomes and basic skills, we're not seeing the 25% that haven't even signed up for class yet. And we need to help our staff learn to deal with cultural competence in the environment where our students are coming in that are tentatively connected, because they're not identified as college students from their own perspective. And if somebody looks at them wrong, they're going to run. And so we need to shift the cultural competence part on both the faculty, staff, administrator side, as well as the students. So I hope I answered your question. You yeah. did. I know we're running short on time. I just want to say I want to congratulate you again for this important work and really hope to see the benefits of it spread beyond the, even the constituencies that you've been working with. I think for women, for LGBT populations, African American, Asian American groups, low income groups generally, finding ways to apply this to the success of those groups is something that we need to invest in going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming up. I think the relevance, cu cultural competency, I think those things are, are, I think we'd all join you in saying that those things are quite quite important. But I just wanted to kind of hone in on on uh, one, one of the areas where you give a lot of emphasis to. And uh, we, we've had programs like Bridge, uh, Puente, Upward Bound, some others that deal with the trans transition for students and certainly try to deal with it those first three weeks of college and um, we look at those success but the question is just scaling up how, how how do we begin to do that can you speak a little bit to to how you see that in the context of your program how is it that we scale up so that we're able to do that and in addition to that maybe the di differences between students who are attending the, the elite universities and the students that we're dealing with and also in the context of those three three weeks, how can we truly translate that that success, whatever it might be, to success here? Mm -hmm. Good question. So you had three questions, I think. Just a couple of them. Okay. So um, one of them is how do we um, how do we scale up programs like this? Um, you know. We do have programs in our state that there's two types of scaling. One is breadth, how many colleges are you in, and the other one is depth, how many students do you serve in the college. One of the programs has, I think, 39 colleges, but in all but two of their colleges, they have one cohort of students per year, so 25 students per year, and the two that don't is two students per two cohorts per year, 50 students. So that's breadth scaling. What we've done is we've scaled to 350 students. We started with 200 students at Broward College in Florida because they're a 70,000 student college, so they have to have a big impact up front. They wanted to have 3,000 students going through the program. Well, if tuition pays for it and apportionment, they can do it because they don't have to get outside funds, and you don't have to deal with the 50% law or the 50% rule because the, st your, the students are getting the services through the curriculum in the classroom and from each other. And so to scale the program, the key thing 
is how do you get the leadership and the colleges to take the political risk of reprioritizing funding? Because the issue isn't you have two really good programs and which one are you going to scale? The issue is you got to take those resources from the way you're currently doing it. That's a big political issue. And so if you're an administrator and you don't want to deal with that kind of contention in your college, and it's going to be a contentious issue unless you set the ground rules and have evidence become the basis for your decision, then you know, it just becomes a political battle. So it's going to take leadership, and it's going to be leadership of the resources that we currently are allocating and putting them into other ways of serving the students. So that, I, I don't know if that answered right, that first where question. You, where would you might, might move or prioritize things? What, do you have any suggestions or any idea where well, maybe administrators could do that? Well, I think that the, the research that we're starting to find or the data that we're finding on accelerated math and accelerated English is I think one of the first places that we want to be putting our resources towards, of which we incorporate that in our program, but our program is focused on really redefining students' support so that it's not external to the student, it's actually internal to the student and in terms of their own transformation, and it's done through curriculum. So this first two weeks we were talking about, the orientation, I don't know of any other program that has curriculum that's laid out. We have 14 to 15 or 17 exercises per day that we do with students through the, that period of the orientation. And it's a facilitated curriculum, which means it's experiential, because you're not the expert telling the students what the content is. You're facilitating the experience, and they have the content, because it's their lives that they're reflecting on. And, so, and also, you're helping them look at their educational experiences. Like we, What we do is we unpack the industrialization of education, so they start to understand the K through 12 system that they came from, and how it was designed, you know, there was a debate between Dewey and a debate between Tierney back in the 1918, 1920. Tierney won with the IQ test. You know, Dewey didn't. What did the system look like? So they start to unpack what they went through in terms of their experience and who they are, and is that the right experience for them? Well, what we've done now is that we've created curriculum. It's not like I, I get a curriculum in California. We have these outlines, they're three pages long, and you, you have a chemistry background, so you can interpret it or you have a math background, you can interpret it. This is experiential, affective education. No one gets their master's degree in this field. It hasn't been modeled for faculty unless they come from some specialized area. Even counseling doesn't have this kind of training. So what we're finding is that you have to do professional development to have faculty learn this, and it's not rocket science. It's just getting off the sage from the stage and moving into facilitating the experience for the student. So what we're finding is professional development is critical. So to get the same outcomes, you have to have a pedagogy, professional development embedded in curriculum that you can touch, feel, and actually help you in the classroom. Because I find that faculty, they want to be successful in the classroom. That's the key thing. And if you can facilitate for them how to do that, they adopt it. It's really a faculty-driven thing. When faculty get it, they go, oh, I want to do this work because they like the success and they like the connection with students. That's why they came to community colleges to teach, or they would have been at a four-year college doing research, many of them. And so, um, so maybe you're not sh suggesting a, a shift in, in uh, monetary resources, but more so uh, a shift in job responsibilities of the key, key folks. Well, in terms of the orientation piece of it, the way that our curriculum is adopted by colleges is that it, it, it cannot be put in any discipline. Okay, because if you're going to scale to thousands of students, you can't put it within one discipline. Plus, there isn't any discipline that has the experience and the education around experiential affective learning. So you can't really put it within a discipline. So you have to make it general so that any faculty that wants to be trained in this, and they have to be certified, just because you go to our training doesn't mean that you can teach it. You have to get graded on it, and so just like any outcomes. And so, and that creates a little bit of tension because there's certain groups that feel like they need to own something, but once you do that, you limit the ability to scale anything because you only have, what, five people in a department? Or you have, at most, 20 people in a department? You can't scale it. So you have to provide a curriculum that you can train people on how to use it and get the same results and that's what our affective, and I didn't show you that information, but we have the, the results. It's actually in the student success case study 
and it shows the affective shifts that occur in two weeks. And it's reproducible, reproducible. And that's one of the things that we wanted. So I, did that address? Yeah. No, we're fine. But it is a change in resources. It's a change in resources of how you're doing it today and putting it towards mm -hmm. courses and methodologies and pedagogies that are different than what you're doing today. That is a shift in resources. Thanks for the presentation, and proud of you as an alum of Pasadena City College, where also I serve on the board. Oh, that's but, good. But um, uh, I don't have a question for Diego, per se, but it's more for us. Um, this is one example of a, a, a system that we know works, and the wonderful thing about this is we know what works to help students persist and help students succeed. And uh, I shared with uh, President Baca and, and Chancellor Harris some recent data about Pasadena City College and how we implemented some of these, uh, these lessons uh, from the Student Success Task Force into a local uh, first year experience that has yielded significant uh, results for African American and Latino students in, in much higher rates of persistence and course completion. And so we know all these that work and we, we do highlight successful programs at the board level but I think f in order for us to continue to try to m make sure we're doing what works, just like uh, we're doing in CTE and Vice Chancellor Van Tenquantla, but what works for jobs in the economy, what works for student <coughs> success, is we're partnering with our the Academic Senate and then um, sharing those lessons statewide. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to learn from presentations like this and other projects around the state that are having tangible results and sharing them and highlighting them and then hopefully finding ways for other districts to institutionalize them. Any other uh, questions? Well, thank you very much for thank joining us this afternoon. Much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for this opportunity. And look forward to more of uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you. One comment. Uh, one comment. Yes. We have one comment for our public forum. It's from Scott Hamilton. Hello again, uh, Scott Hamilton representing California Association for uh, Post-Secondary Education and Disability and I'm also a faculty at uh, Cosumnes River College here in Sacramento. And really I just wanted to remind the board of things that we've said in the past, keep the issue uh, forward in your mind about uh, funding for the DSPS program, disabled students. Um, we received an additional $15 million this year in the state budget which is a good start. Uh, it's not a job well done, it's a job well started. Uh, we, uh, five years ago, we had $115 million to serve over 115,000 DSPS students. Now, this year with the increase, we're at 84.2 million with 100, almost 119,000. So that's a 3% increase in students, but still, uh, uh, many millions of dollars below where we were in the past. Um, and we can't reduce the number of students that we serve. We can't reduce the accommodations that we approve for students. Uh, but we're trying to do it with a lot less money, therefore a lot less staff. It, it, it just isn't working. Um, the system overall has lost about 21 to 22 percent of their students with a cut of about 26% in state funds uh, uh, for, for the system overall. Uh, and that's with the increase that they've gotten this year. It was over 30% last year. Um, but again, DSPS has gained students um, with an initial cut of 40% and now we're at about 26.8% of where we were. Um, but in addition, there is a lot of pressure on campuses to try and address within DSPS the Student Success Act services, which have never traditionally been the, the, the purpose or priority of DSPS, but all areas are being asked to try and provide those services. Uh, so that's kind of an additional uh, burden on the program, which is serving more students with less money. Uh, there was a report a year and a half ago, June 2012, that was released. It was commissioned by the Chancellor's Office from NPR Associates uh, and 
to me, the most telling statistic that came out of that, that report about uh, the, the, the effect of the reductions in DSPS funding were that 26% of students surveyed said that they had to drop a class that they were in because they weren't getting their accommodations. Not, not they couldn't get in a class, that they, were, that they had to drop a class. Um, if you multiply that times the number of students in DSPS throughout the system, that's almost 31,000 students a year that aren't getting the accommodations that they need. Uh, that report also said that there were 73% of students who felt they had no reason to file a grievance. If you look at the reverse of that, that's 27% who think they might have a reason to file a grievance, which is pretty equal to the 26% who said they didn't get accommodation or they had to drop a course. Uh, we're also seeing your students your with time greater. Has elapsed, so if you can conclude. Okay. Uh, m the whole point is just keep that forward thinking so that when Bryce and Dan and Sorry, I'm not very formal, so, but we kind of feel ownership of Bryce because he was our chancellor, so we refer to him as Bryce. Um, as, as board members and chancellor's office staff are advocating uh, with the governor's office, uh, the legislature, et cetera, just to keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will reconvene in, in the morning at 9 a.m.